Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. Les films qui ont fait la gloire du cinéma français. Les Baffons de Jean Renoir. Quai des Brumes de Marcel Carnet. La Belle et la Bête de Jean Cocteau. Rendez-vous de juillet de Jacques Becker. Le journal d'un curé de campagne de Robert Bresson. Les Diaboliques d'Henri-Georges Clouseau. Et les Grandes Manœuvres de René Clair figurent au palmarès du prix Louis de Luc, la plus haute récompense du cinéma français. Cette année, les membres du jury du prix Louis de Luc, critiques et écrivains célèbres, réunis au cours d'un dîner au pavillon d'Armenonville, se sont mis d'accord au troisième tour de vote. Ils ont couronné un film à peine terminé, Ascenseur pour l'échafaud, d'un jeune cinéaste, Louis Mal, qui fut le co-réalisateur du merveilleux Monde du silence du commandant Cousteau. Voici Louis Mal, très ému, félicité par les membres du jury. Jeanne Moreau et Maurice René, principaux interprètes d'Ascenseur pour l'échafaud, viennent rejoindre leur metteur en scène. La direction de cette salle est heureuse de vous annoncer qu'elle a retenu en exclusivité pour son prochain spectacle « Ascenseur pour l'échafaud ». On peut tout prendre comme alibi, tout. Les femmes, les petites filles, les garçons de café, les amis d'enfance, les maris trompés. Mais pas les ascenseurs. Non, franchement, c'est idiot. Non, non, Louis. T'occupe pas, monte. Ça leur fera les pieds à ces sales bûches. Puis il faut brouiller les pistes. Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Rob St. Mary. Joining me, of course, Mr. Mike White. Alpha, just take the stairs. Yeah, that makes sense. And with us this week, author Jedediah Ayers. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome, sir. Our November continues as we take a look at crime and detective film, but with a foreign accent this month. And this week, we consider Louis Malle's debut feature film, Elevator to the Gallows. Film star Jean Moreau as Florence and Maurice Rone as Julien, a pair of lovers who hatch a plan to do away with Florence's husband. Well, it should all go simple enough until a few things trip up Julien ends up trapped inside the elevator. Then some young kids steal his car and then do some horrible things as well. While Florence wonders what the hell happened to her man since no one seemed to have seen him for a while and she hasn't heard from him either. Shot in beautiful black and white and featuring a legendary improvised jazz score by the great Miles Davis just before he was huge, Elevator of the Gallows brings more than just an interesting plot to the screen. Asks him some questions about the nature of self, love, and life, as only Louis Malle could do, even at the age of 25. Of course, we'll be getting into some spoilers on this episode, a.k.a. telling you how it ends. So if you haven't seen Elevator to the Gallows, uh, why don't you go check it out, and then come back, because, uh, of course, we'll be waiting for you. But all that opening stuff is just the surface, so let's get to it. With our guest, Jed, when was the first time you saw Elevator to the Gallows, and what did you think? You know, I had been on my radar for several years. I love crime films. I love uh, of all periods, So, but I'm, I'm such a Philistine. It really wasn't until uh, a few weeks ago that I first watched it, and I watched it at few times since so i thought it was amazing i couldn't believe i'd gone this long without seeing it before uh i, I love the p the pace of it and, and the mood and the, the everything the the miles davis score evokes it's beautiful as for you mr white i am also a philistine this has also been on my to watch list for a long time I think this might be the first Louis Mall film that I've seen. I'll have to double check, but yeah, might as well go and start at the beginning. Next stop, Atlantic City, baby. You haven't seen My Dinner with Andre? Okay, I take it back. I have seen that one for sure. All right. I was going to yep. say, if you haven't seen it, most people at least know it in some respect. As for me, Elevator to the Gallows saw it on Criterion when uh, the Criterion Collection put this thing out. I believe it was... I happen to have it sitting right next to me in uh, 2006, and I just bought it on Lark. I go, it looks beautiful, and I heard about this score that Miles Davis had done and picked it up and uh, 
was completely blown away. I knew Jean Moreau from Get Ready to Take a Drink, Louis Bunuel's uh, Diary of a Chambermaid, and of course other films of the period in France in the 50s and 60s. But I uh, have to say in here, it's captured quite well um, out on the street in, in some beautiful close-ups. So it was rather scandalous that she was without makeup through most of the film. We'll be getting into that in the interview later on. So as we get into the plot of Elevator to the Gallows, um, it starts off uh, with a phone call. Yeah, first time that we see our couple, and they're not together, but you kind of don't know that. Like It takes a little while for me to even realize that they're on the phone to one another, what's going on there finally kind of figure out what's happening and then yeah we never see these two together which is really really interesting i think it was a great way to keep these characters separated you know emotionally as well as physically throughout the film yeah i really like that they didn't do all that flashback stuff we've come to you know like uh, like they were talking about doing gravity doing a bunch of flashbacks and and they finally decided not to do that and keep it all in the present and i thought that was a great choice. I'm not sure when doing all the flashbacks became became the rage, but uh, not ever having them together it was great. And it definitely shows the division between the two of them, first them being on the phone, and then they're never in the same frame except uh, at the very end, and we'll get to that in a little while. So as things go on, we get the feeling that uh, Julien works in this office, and that um, I guess the guy that he works for is uh, the guy he's got to make it look like uh, killed himself. Who, it sounds like it was his commanding officer in the war. Is that, is that the impression you guys are getting as well? Yeah, I couldn't tell if he was a, like a, a, a mercenary of some sort or he was actually actually his, you know, his boss. Because he, he says to him, uh, you made a bunch of money during the war and now you're making a bunch of money in Algiers and... So, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what his role was. Well, I think that it's alluded to that he was a um, a member of the French Foreign Legion, uh, especially by the, the photo that's in the paper later, and that uh, his boss brings up Indochina to him and then also Algeria. So I get the feeling that he was a veteran of both of those wars. I want to say, wasn't Algeria sometime right around this point? I mean, it, I, if not the... The actual conflict, uh, at least Battle for Algiers, was definitely somewhere around here. The uh, amazing film with the terrific Ennio Morricone score. Well, definitely uh, the French-Indochina War was in the early 50s. I think it ended by 55, 56, something like that. And then, of course, as you were saying, Algeria was around the same time, um, mid-50s, around this period. So, And I think that this also helps to show a certain generational division between uh, this guy who fought in the war, this guy who obviously was older than him, and there is also another couple that was older, and we get the feeling that they were the ones who lived through World War II. And then there's even a younger generation than Julian, who is uh, the, the teenage kids, who would be, you know, what, uh, 17 years old or something like that. So there's these sort of like three different generations, three different layers of sort of French society and looking at sort of the world in which they're in. And I like that the guy who seems to be the head of security, or at least the security guard on duty for the weekend, it sounds like he served underneath, or it, it, he definitely served at some capacity in some sort of conflict. I noticed today that he walks with a limp, and he always calls Julian captain. And right. at one point, Julian has to correct him and say, like, not anymore. So we're on equal footing now, as it were. I like, too, that the... Uh Business and war are equated several times. First, when uh, Julian's boss says, ah, you were a big shot during the war, but, you know, killing in war is, is no big deal, but, but now these are serious matters, <laughs> and you don't have the stomach for it. And uh, then the German later says this, when he's talking about uh, the occupation uh, you know, of France, he says, Germans are just businessmen, and we, you know, we wear sharp suits. Uh, when we travel abroad. Yeah, actually, uh, just looking up the Algerian war, and it sounds like the uh, Algerian independence movement was happening from 54 to 62. So we're kind of um, right in the uh, the middle of that here. 
And that might be why the pipeline has to not travel the most optimal route when uh, Julian is describing that to his boss. And speaking of that scene when it then turns with the boss where it moves from we're just talking business to I'm going to kill you, he just kind of laughs at him. He just finds it funny. I, I like that the boss isn't taking it serious. Yeah, you don't have the stomach for it. You know, this isn't this isn't the battlefield anymore. You don't have the guts. Basically, the boss is so calm, cool, and collected. And I love that we don't actually see the murder. That we cut from that to the uh, the secretary who's out in the, the in the floor below sharpening her pencils with that, that incredible pencil sharpener. I, before we move on. Past that, I want to ask you guys about the clock that uh, Julian has on his desk. At one point, he asks about the time, and it's seven o'clock. And then he looks at this clock, and it says seven four, and then it flips to seven five. So I'm not thinking that it's seven fifty, but it's it's only two digits. I mean, was that a clock, or is that something else that I'm thinking as a clock? It, I don't know, but it it struck my. There were a lot of little details like that that caught my eye, and I and I I read something or I heard an interview with uh, with Louis Mall where he was he was saying you know I I wanted Paris to look like it's not been depicted in the uh, in films you know I didn't want it to look the old the old Paris I was looking into the future you know that this is the Paris that's going to be in ten fifteen years. And uh, there were so there were little details like that. I wondered, is this his like hyper uh, realized? You know, is this like Blade Runner back then? <laughs> is this, we're uh, in but, Alphaville now, right? Well, it was just little touches like that, though, that did trip me up. I was I was wondering about that clock too. Well, there's little things that ask you if they're playing in in reality or are they playing in people's heads and i would say only a little bit um a little bit of that i wouldn't say it's to an extreme level like for example uh after the scene where he kills the boss and stages it as a suicide there's a black cat on the railing right on the building like so how it, it's like okay we know that the building has this i guess kind of um edge around it where you can walk into uh, into the windows and whatnot around the edge of the building, but I'm not led to believe that there's a residence in here. So the you know how did the cat get that far up? So it just seems like it's there's this omen kind of thing that you know that might just be a projection of his own guilt. Yeah, and kind of keeping on this whole idea of the gadgets and stuff. I mean, just gadgets are kind of fetishized in this whole film and technology. I mean, it's the elevator that we're going to get to in a minute here that really kind of trips things up. But even when it comes to the cars and the kids are so into, or at least the boy is so into the different types of cars and can name the different cars and, you know, oh, that's a, the gull wing or whatever. And uh, between the, the clock and the pencil sharpener and then I, there's, uh, oh, the little camera that Julian has that will come into it later on. I mean, there's just like this whole uh, treatment of technology that really seems to, yeah, either put them in a, a future place or just like, you know, people are so into their gadgets now, which is uh, kind of ironic coming from somebody who's just, you know, stuck to his iPhone all day long. And when they're at the, uh, that, that scene at the motel, uh, that little uh, <laughs> cool little car that drives up and delivers dinner to him. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. That's one of those details. I thought, is that is it, is he fucking with us? Is that <laughs> did they really do that? Is that uh, one of those futuristic type touches he was talking about? It looked cool. So yeah, we don't see the murder, which I think is great, and we just see kind of not even really the aftermath. We don't see any gore, or anything like that. It's just. We cut to the pencil sharpener, which allegedly is hiding the, the shot that happens. And we have Julian taking care of things a floor above and uh, making sure that everything looks proper for his boss's quote-unquote suicide. And then you know, we, we cut back to him and him coming back down. And again, he's almost tripped up by technology because the secretary, even though she's like five feet away, is calling into his office because he has to not be disturbed. And uh, he makes it down just in time, so it doesn't seem too odd that you know he's uh, in his office, and it takes him so long to get to his phone. 
then, of course, everybody's leaving for the day. And they head down the elevator and da 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 da, da get into the car. And he starts up the car and then realizes that the thing that would hang him is hanging off the building. <laughs> yes, the literal rope that could hang him is, is off of there. And while he is looks up and sees that he's taking the uh, what he, what how he sees it is that his uh, the uh, roof of his car is retracting very nice gadget again and it's uh, that also attracts the attention of Veronique and Louis uh, I think it's Louis the the boyfriend Veronique li- works at the flower shop across the way and she really uh, admires uh, Julien Tavignet. <laughs> And, but Louis is, uh, he's just, he's one of these rebellious youths. It seems like nothing really gets him going until he sees the car and is just really admiring the car and decides, hey, what the hell? Let's take it for a joyride. While Mr. Traven- Tavernier is uh, going back into the building, might as well just uh, take this sucker for a ride. Yeah, and they decide to go on quite a ride. Uh, it's not like, hey, we're just going to take it around the block and come back because he'll be oh, out no. of the building soon. Oh, no. Um, so they they head out, and actually, uh, it's probably a good thing that, I guess, uh, they didn't come back and wait and go, hmm, I wonder where he's at, uh, because this is where he gets stuck in the elevator. Yeah, powering down the building for the weekend. Very nice, uh, economical thing to do. Uh, you know, just uh, nobody's supposed to be using those elevators. Let's just turn the power right off for them. So he's kind of tripped up by that guy with the limp that I was talking about before, the the security guard. And this is also right around the time. And this was really when the movie hit that nice place for me. Because we've never seen Florence and Julianne together. And she's walking down the street and sees his car go by and sees Veronique in the car and just suddenly decides, oh, he must not have been, you know, serious about me anyway. And I was just like, oh, that's such a nice twist that she sees that and just sets this whole thing off into other directions. Yeah, it's uh, it's remarkable, too, because once uh, once that happens in, in a lot of a lot of noir stories where where this goes on, you know, like like uh, Postman Always Rings Twice, you know, two lovers uh, conspire to kill the husband of the one. Uh, you know, once once things go south for the the couple, they turn on each other like always. But in this one, she never, even though she's seen with her eyes, you know, that he's or she thinks she's seen that he's abandoned her. Uh, he's really let her go. She she hasn't let him go. She doesn't give up on him, uh, which I thought was I don't see that much. No, but you might talk about noir. I mean, this story, the the way that it starts going from here, you know, we, we've both been to noir con. We both know there have been so many uh, battles about the definition of noir, and I still think the best one is that you're fucked at the beginning of the story, and you're even more fucked at the end. And this one just hits that so perfectly. This whole conspiracy, you know, is not going to work out to to murder the husband. And it just keeps getting worse and worse from there. Every twist and turn that we're going to take from here on out is just going to add fuel to that fire. And it's also a plot that could easily be cured if he had a cell phone. (laughs) Take that, Mr. Fancy Clock. Well, you know, at the same time, the thing that's funny is that if you tried to remake this in in today's world, it would be, oh, I left my cell phone on my desk, and then I got stuck in the elevator. You know, they did remake this in, like, 2010, and I'm trying to remember because it's so beat per beat a remake of it, and I... Unfortunately, there were no English subtitles because it's a Japanese film, and the subtitles that were included with it were just garbage. So I don't know how they took care of the cell phone or if they just didn't address it at all. But yeah, you're right. This would have been either leaving the cell phone on the desk or, oh, the battery's dead. Oh, oh. (laughs) Or Julian, or I mean, uh, Louis stole it. It was in the car. There you go. Yeah, he, he took it in, plugged it in the car, had his uh, his sink started. And, you know, and then they get the uh, killer soundtrack on. You know, get the the Miles Davis tune track coming up on there. You know, I'm in the mood for some jazz now. But no, 
No, no such luck. And this is one of the first instances where we've got a little girl as being part of the plot. I noticed that today on my rewatch where it's just like, because she stands out. The first little girl, at one point, Jean Moreau goes to the building and we've got uh, uh, Maurice Rene. Julian is kind of half stuck in the elevator, can't necessarily get out. But you can hear the noise from the gate as Jean Moreau is is shaking it. Uh, Florence is shaking it. And this little girl comes up and she's just like, what are you up to? You know, and it's like, okay, well, that's kind of a weird thing. And I kept expecting it to come back. Like she would be the material witness to this whole thing. But luckily that wasn't the case because I, I kind of hate those weird little twists of fate sometime. But uh, and then later on in the film, we get another little girl who kind of sets some things in motion as well. So it's just like, okay, this is, uh, again, I guess maybe kind of that uh, personification of the black cat that you were talking about. Yeah, when you were bringing that up, I thought, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Is that the same little girl? It's not the same little girl, is it? I don't think it is because that other little girl has those big old Coke bottle glasses going on. Yeah, she's very much a uh, a Hitchcock-type character where the the girl looks too much, so she ends up having to wear glasses, you know? (laughs) And she's the one that recognizes julian at the cafe her father is just like "Eh, whatever leave me alone kid and she's the one like no no and i love her looking back and forth from the paper to julian but to the paper to julian i feel a little bad for maurice rene in this film because he spends what 80 percent of this movie in an elevator and there's not a whole lot for him to do in there but that's one of the great bits of the movie i thought that he's the man of action the you know the uh, the young lovers the the girl spends so much time bragging to Louis about what a badass he is and how Louis can't do anything but this guy could do it all and he's our our handsome leading man and he's he's the only one who's really capable and and got a this specific skill set and he can't he can't use it he literally can't get himself out of a box. <laughs> Yeah, Veronique is, is infatuated by Mr. Tavigny uh, to the point where when later on, when she and Louis end up meeting this couple, this German couple that uh, you mentioned before, Rob, she introduces themselves as Mr. and Mrs. Tra- Tavigny. And at one point she screws up and ends up calling her uh, boyfriend by his real name, but then quickly, you know, counters with his uh his new name of julienne so yeah she's definitely holds uh, the real julienne in high regard and uh yeah you're right it's such a great irony that he's just you know cut back to him in the elevator trying to get out <laughs> which which is funny to me because this guy has about as much charisma as wallpaper paste i mean julienne is not a very excitable guy he doesn't seem all that passionate um I don't get a lot of smiles, a lot of joking around with this guy. He seems kind of sociopath or disconnected in a way. Um, I must say, he seems really disconnected. He seems kind of flat in his affect. I mean, even when he's in the elevator, I think like some of us would be banging on the doors and like, what the fuck? And like, like screaming and shit, but not him. Oh, no. He does lose it near the end, though, when the police are questioning. Uh, he really breaks down. It's, very, it's an emotional, emotional thing for him. But I, I, you know, I wonder if it's just that, you know, it, that soldier's training kicking in when he realizes he's in an impossible situation. You know, don't expend energy doing, you know, unemotional <laughs> uh, foolishness. But, uh, but yeah, he does he does lose it there toward the end. He really breaks down, and that's the last time we see him. Well, yeah, I mean, and especially him being a veteran of the war. I mean, that's another really nice noir thing that we have in this film as far as so many of the great noir characters that we've talked about in the past on here. We talked about Dixon Steele in A Lonely Place and how he came back from the war very changed. And I can really see where this guy, Julian, probably saw a lot of shit in the Indochina War. So I wouldn't be surprised if he was a happier person at one point and now he is flat because he did see such you know, atrocities in the Indochina war. There's also that great scene where he's in the elevator and you talked about her shaking the gates outside and he's just, he's, he's, he's in between floors and he's trying to squeeze. He's seeing if he can squeeze through the door and he's, he's, he's finagled it open, but he can't, 
there's that great shot of of just his torso, his upper, his arms, and his his head. It looks like he's getting like sucked down a hole, like right into hell or something. Like that. <laughs> the door closes on him. It's a beautiful, beautiful shot. I love later on how we see all of the cigarette butts because he's just smoked so much while he was stuck in there. Yeah. So as the kids take the car, they end up off and um, meet this couple, as you said, this older couple, who I would say is probably the same age as the uh, the boss in the beginning of the film. And this is, as you were saying, the um, the German guy. Yeah, he's got that nice white head of hair there. You know, he, he's definitely an older guy. They recognize he's German as he passes them in the car. Like, <laughs> they're like, oh, foreigners. No, he's, he's German, yeah. He's like, the, the resentment is, is pretty great. I wonder if they have one of those DE stickers on the back of their car that I just couldn't see or what. But yeah, somehow they recognize that these people are German at, you know, 20 paces. So they end up hanging out with these guys, and uh, this is kind of a mismatch because they're this young teenage couple. These are these folks, I don't know, probably in their 50s, I don't know, 40s. Yeah, I wouldn't really see them hanging out too often. No, it's more like them hanging out with almost their grandparents because the guy looks a little bit older. And they um, they have some drinks, and they have some discussion, and they talk about... You know, some generational things, I guess. You know, the, he talked about the, the thing about uh, discussion about the war and during the war this. And and then these young kids, uh, not too hip with sort of the state of France as it is. Yeah, these whippersnappers, they're just, uh, they, they don't care about anything these days other than that rock and roll music. And they're just nihilists. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, and cars. Louis loves cars. Louis What's does love the cars. Thing? They do a U-turn on the highway and start going the other way. And she's like, ah, oh, not again. Are you kidding me? And he says, his line was like, you either love cars or you don't. <laughs> and he's just going to ride that thing until it runs out of gas or something. It's Yeah, she says something like they've been up and down that same stretch of road like four times by yeah. then. <laughs> yeah, that's he, a little much, Louis. And Louis also seems very concerned with presenting like he's he's feeding the the german uh a bunch you know he's really thrown himself into this tavernier role and he's uh talking to him about his time in the army and <laughs> in the wars and and the german of course sees right through him but lets him go lets him hang himself yeah the german guy uh, up until the very last moment of his life he's a pretty smart dude I get the feeling that he kind of finds it entertaining to be hanging out with this kid. I can see that, yeah. And especially, I mean, even towards the end where uh, they wake up in the middle of the night and then they want to steal the guy's car and he pulls the gun on him and he's got the cigarette or the the cigar tube and he's like, oh, you know, so once again it's the older generation going, oh, you you young kids, you don't have the guts to really do that. Right. Yeah, he's, this, he's taking digs at Louis the whole time that Louis's not catching. You know, he's like, uh, he calls him. He, he says, "Oh, come in, come in, have <laughs> have dinner with us." Because after all, you're such a, you're quite a driver yourself. And all we've seen Louis do is, you know, when he first gets in the car, it's got the key, and he backs up, and he, you know, instead of going forward, he goes backward. And then when he pulls in behind the Germans, he runs into the, you know, he, he's he loves cars. He's He's not a driver. He's not. Uh, so I love all the little digs he's taking at him, constantly talking over Louis's head, and Louis's not not catching on to it. Yeah, no, he uh, he probably reads like Car and Driver magazine all the time, but has you know driven maybe maybe he got his driver's permit. I don't even know. <laughs> well, and he stole a scooter when they pull up to the motel. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Uh, he doesn't want to go in because he's sure he's a wanted man because he stole a scooter last week. And oh, yeah. He might be looking for him. Yeah, he's got that awesome Vespa later on. It's just like, okay. Yeah, my my wife, when she was watching, it was just like, he doesn't even have a motorcycle. I'm like, come on, honey. This is Europe. They drive Vespas all the time. <laughs> it's funny, too, you brought up uh, Atlantic City uh, because he was reminding me somewhat of Burt Lancaster in that, you know, when Burt's all, he's, he's suddenly got a very inflated 
uh, idea of himself and is trying to, you know, live like he's a, he's a badass <laughs> still. And, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like you could age Louie in real time and he's, he's Burt Lancaster in Atlantic City. I can totally see that, yeah. So the kid ends up killing the German and his wife, and they steal the car. And this leads to what I call Romeo and Juliet times two in this movie. Because the kids get together and they're like, oh man, they're going to find out. They're going to come after us. Uh, Let's kill ourselves. Let's poison ourselves and go to sleep. And then, so they're Romeo and Juliet, and then I also see... Uh, Florence and Julianne is a doomed romance as well. So we have two doomed romances, I guess, in here. Yeah, but Louis is so incompetent that he can't even manage that right. So they end up, instead of killing themselves, they just end up with a wicked hangover. (laughs) Good job. They feel uh, such despair, but they don't feel guilty. They feel victimized. I love that. that, uh, She's talking about, uh, she's blaming the gun. Oh, why, why... Why did he have a gun in the car? Terrible things happen when there's guns around. Right. It's never like, you shot him, you asshole. Goddamn bleeding heart liberal. Yeah, Yeah. it's the gun's problem. It's not the person who used it, right? Yeah. And yeah, so the, but they're, they recognize or they think they see their fate coming and and that's what's making him miserable. Not that, uh, not that they really feel bad about what they did. They feel bad about what's to come. Yeah, and that being that they see the paper, and voila, to use a French word, uh, Julien, in his lovely outfit, in the um, uniform, is on the front of the paper, wanted for murder for killing these two old folks. What's up with that? Yeah, because Louis and Veronique have left clues all over the place that the... That Louis was Mr. Tavernier, so now he's getting the blame, which I love this whole... this whole twisty turny thing that we have going on here is just fantastic because eventually he's going to get out of the elevator he's going to get caught as being the killer of these people which he wasn't but then he can't give his alibi that he was stuck in that elevator the whole time he's just put in this horrible position which i'm just like this kind of turn in the screws on characters is why i love film noir yeah, and it goes back and forth, you know. In a lot of uh, in a lot of film noir, there's people getting punished, and they're clearly being punished, even if it's for the wrong things. You know, they're 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 sinking for for sins they didn't commit. But in this one, they toy almost it really skates skates a line between uh, you know punishment comes, but it, it doesn't. Or it's not punishment, rather. It's it's fate. You know, is it that black cat? Is it that little girl. It, it doesn't matter how skilled Julian is. He can't get out of the box. It doesn't matter how well they planned this. You know, it, it's going to fall apart. And it doesn't matter how incompetent Louis is. He's going to get away with it, you know? Yes, until Florence decides to step in, the Jean Moreau character, where she's just like, this is not right. I'm going to save my Julianne. And she just really kind of, kind of gets there, but then not 100%. Uh, kind of fucks herself over by trying to help out Julianne. Yeah, she gets picked up for prostitution first. And- <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's been out all night long looking for Julianne, so she's got her whole little Mr. Toad's Wild Ride thing going on as well. And I'm trying to remember when we get introduced to Lino Ventura. And I was really happy to see Lino Ventura show up as one as the uh, uh, commissioner, uh, Sherry, I believe his name is. Because and it's weird to see him in such a minor role in this when I'm so used to him being the star of these films. You know, like The Second Breath or Army of Shadows or some of these films. So to see him... <laughs> relegated to such a tiny role i was just like oh but he's so great and he's got that great face that you know boxers smashed in face that i love so much but he was great he was kind of i mean really with so much of this film i was reminded almost of like a, a lieutenant colombo episode because we see the murder being laid out so much and then just all of these things happening and i was waiting for a colombo to come in and just start peeling back that onion and Ventura, I think Ventura could have really have been a good Columbo type character, but uh, 
yeah, he he, uh, he knows what's going on, or he can figure it out fairly well. But yeah, unfortunately, he doesn't get to fuck with the characters too much. He's so young in this one. Oh yeah, like, you know, I, he he had a lot of character in his face already. But uh, yeah, he's much younger than I'm I'm used to seeing him. It seemed. Yeah, I'm much more used to like a late seventies, mid seventies, late seventies Lino Ventura. You know, Jean Moreau's been out walking the streets uh, all night, and um, I I think at least one whole reel of the film is just her face walking around. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it, she's it's very nice easy thing. on the eyes. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it is a thing. So there you have it. And then once he gets picked up, once he gets out of the elevator because um, the uh, power comes back on. And he's picked up rather quickly because they're like, "Hey, uh, you're uh, you're on the front of the paper. What's going on?" Give me a large coffee and lots of croissants. I was just like, "Wow, you really are French, aren't you?" <laughs> <laughs> well, he's on the paper too because the uh, the prosecutor is so uh, the prosecutor's telling the paper what's happened, <laughs> and they're just printing it. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, prosecutor told us what happened. And yeah. uh, his pictures in the paper and everything already. And uh, well, that's yeah. the role of the press, isn't it? Really, just to take dictation from people that know better. I wonder if that was, you know, part of the commentary on Algiers and uh, and uh, Indochina. You know, just that. Yeah, they just say they just print whatever whatever the authorities say, <laughs> and we'll we'll print it right for you. You want to just give us a press release? We'll we'll print that for you instead. We've got. Jean Moreau uh, paying them a visit, which is just a kind of a bizarre scene. She she figures out rather quickly what has happened uh, as far as the uh, the car and the the girl and all that stuff. And she becomes the detective for the while, doing a much better job than anybody on the actual police force and tracks down Veronique and Louis at Veronique's uh, apartment where they uh, have uh, failed in their suicide attempt. So they're all groggy, and uh, uh, Jean Moreau, Florence, comes in and uh, pockets that camera and then uh, tells us the cops where they were at, You know, makes an anonymous phone call, and is getting really belligerent with the cops, too, because they just they want to know who she is and why she's making the call. And she's just like, listen, you know, I'm telling you, where these murderers are, you need to get over here right now. And meanwhile, Louis uh, getting away on his Vespa, and uh, yeah, so she's the one that manages to provide the cops with the really damning evidence of all these photos of the kids with the old couple that they murdered. But unfortunately, she didn't think about the other pictures that were on the camera, which leads us to the only time that we actually see. Florence and Julian on screen together, which is in that damning photograph. And I just love that nice knife twist when we finally see that because she has now given the cops the evidence that those two were a couple and that provides the motive for the, the suicide, quote unquote, of the husband. So such a nice twist there. But I have to say before that, that I love these interrogation scenes because it's all like just three people in a room and no background whatsoever. And a lot of these like kind of eye of God type shots of them. Almost looked like a stage, like a, like a stage play. Totally. Uh, that scene. And that's really brought back in that very end shot where it's the, the dark room and the photos that are you know being developed. And I like that the, the photos are still kind of, you know, appearing as we're in this scene and it's just Lino Ventura and Jean Moreau uh, at the end there in this blackness and they're the only things that are lit. It's just really really well done. You said Louis Malm was only 25 when he made this film? Yeah. Ah, that's amazing. Because yeah, he gets that he gets the noir sensibility. He gets the, the new wave sensibility and we're a few years before the new wave here. If this is what, 58, I want to say 57, 58. Okay. So, you know, those, all those shots of Jean Moreau walking through the city of Paris totally remind me of, you know, all the shots of Jean Seberg in breathless, you know, just 
people people walking through the streets of Paris while they're being filmed is such a new wave type thing for me. And I don't know if that's just because of Breathless or if that was I, – I think there were shots like that in, in things like Shoot the Piano Player and things as well where it was just kind of, you know, put the camera in a car and follow along. This is a little bit more elegant than that. But then we also have the surrealism that we would get from Louis Mal years later and things like uh, Black Moon and those kind of things. So, yeah, it was just so nice that he was able to bring all that stuff together in this first feature film. Yeah, it makes me want to puke. <laughs> 25 years old, damn you! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> old man, yeah. Yeah, I assume that that, uh, that shot of, uh, of the young car thieves... Uh, you know when she stands up in the in the car as they're driving down the road, and it looked so much like Breathless. I assumed, oh, he's he's referencing Godard, but uh, but then I saw no, Breathless didn't come for a couple of years after this. So uh, I wonder if it was the other way around. Yeah, exactly. Not that uh, Godard would you know cop to that or anything. I'm sure it was all all original all the time. Well, not only that, but you also have to remember that they were both influenced by. American crime film, film noir. So Breathless is sort of a low-rent carbon copy of a low-budget American film, like maybe, I don't know, like Detour or something. Or Gun Crazy, yeah. Yeah, yeah Gun Crazy had that, that car shot. Yeah, and, the, uh, and the, the two characters in their sunglasses looking so cool and everything. Well, speaking of cool, I think the soundtrack for this is just amazing. I mean, the fact that it was done basically improv in about two or three takes by Miles Davis and a loose band of musicians that he just happened to have over there. Not his usual crew that he was working with in the States, but just a pickup band that he had in Paris when he was over there for a while. And um, I I think it really sets a mood and the lyricism of that solo trumpet in here really uh, brings across the feeling of Jean Moreau as she's walking around Paris just looking and wondering and i've not seen paris look so lonely in such a long time you know that's one of the things when it comes to the new wave films is just you know capturing things as they're happening almost a uh um uh, cinema verite type thing where it's just like okay this is what the streets of paris look like and with this it just felt really sad and lonely and i know that she's lonely and she's sad she's you know disappointed in everything that's happening but then yeah that trumpet just really brings that out and i i'm not really a jazz guy i think we covered i'm kind of a philistine but but i you know i i recognize that yeah i've heard this ripped off a million times it, it was clearly very influential and, and I, I read something about how the what he'd done is is taken bebop with all the the you know virtuoso notes crammed in there, and he just like he slowed it way down, uh, which is I don't know when you think of Elevator to the Gallows as a crime film. I mean, like American crime films are you know they just go 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 you know plot plot plot. Uh, it's almost kind of mirrors that how he this is much more about tone and. And uh, you know things happen, but it's it's not a it's not a rip roaring uh, picture, you know. And if you are also a jazz philistine, um, just hang around because we're going to talk to a guy who wrote probably the best biography on Miles Davis, and you can get the lowdown on who he was, what he was, and where the soundtrack plays a part in sort of his entire uh, oeuvre, I guess, to use another French word. <laughs> so yeah, let's go ahead, take a break, play an interview with Nathan Southern, author of The Films of Louis Malick, Critical Analysis, and an interview with Jack Chambers, author of Milestones, The Music and Times of Miles Davis, after these important messages. Midnight Matinee presents the beloved musical, John and Tony Die at the End, featuring all the hits... Amerisauce. The cop and beg him to take me to the emergency room to pump my stomach, to bring in an exorcist. To go- Miss Morris. Miss Morris. Um, I really don't think Miss Morris. One head, one heart. I was aiming for his heart. But yeah, I did get him. I feel pretty soy sauce. Gee, Detective Appleton. Now you're getting high, partner. 
on the soy sauce. It's got you. And bestiology. Up until this point, our histories were identical. Bestiology. John and Tony die at the end. Available on Midnight Matinee at the stroke of midnight, Friday, November 13th on WFMU 91.1 FM and streaming at WFMU.org. Be there or be Korok. Available on a track. All hail Korok. Christopher Media, the Weedsman Podcast. Cures rickets, polio, conjunctivitis, AIDS. AIDS. Let's just, let's just go hog wild. Be in the car accident, you just use a little bit, you'll be fine. Yeah, rub it on your car and yourself. <laughs> It'll fix your car and your bones. <laughs> Try this special trick to get out of traffic tickets with Rick Simpson oil. Rub it on the cop. It'll just go away. <laughs> <laughs> the Weedsman Podcast. Every Friday on iTunes and ChristopherMedia.net. Christopher Media. Let's make some noise. Let me ask you a question. Are you getting enough? I bet you'd love more, right? Well, AdamandEve.com wants to give you more with 10 free gifts. First, you'll get a sexy surprise for her. Second, a specially selected toy for him. And third, a little something we know you'll both enjoy. Plus, you'll get six full-length adult movies on DVD. And number 10, free shipping on your entire order. So what do you have to do to get your 10 free gifts? It's not hard. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item. It could be an adventurous new toy, sexy piece of lingerie, or anything you desire. Just enter offer code BOOTH at checkout. And you'll get all 10 free gifts. Go check out adamandeve.com today. Select one item and get 10 free gifts, including free shipping, when you enter offer code BOOTH. That's B-O-O-T-H at adamandeve.com. Hi, this is Andrew from We Hate Movies, and you're listening to The Projection Booth. If you feel like laughing after listening to some serious film discussion, head on over to our show, whmpodcast.com. Every Tuesday, a new episode drops, us ragging on bad movies, where the good folks here at The Projection Booth are talking about good, hearty, cinema-related stuff. Go here for the cinema. Come to us for the laughs afterwards. We Hate Movies, every Tuesday. My name is Nathan Southern. Uh, Robin, I'm I'm, uh, I'm a film writer and critic, and uh, you know, a beginning producer. I used to be a development executive, and about 15 years ago, and um, in Hollywood for a company called Alliance Atlantis, and I uh, just started getting back into that. And now I have three projects under contract and um, with a production company, and so I'm doing that freelance. And um, I wrote for about. 10 years, almost 10 years as a, as a critic and an editor for um, the All Media Guide, which uh, syndicated its reviews to TV Guide Online, so you can find a lot of my reviews are still online there. And my reason for contacting you is to talk about Louis Mall, and you uh, wrote a book or co-wrote the book on Louis Mall? I wrote the book. Uh, well, I had, uh, I have a, uh, there is a co-writer on the book, but he didn't write the text. I wrote the text and he was, uh, Jacques Weisgerber, who's a really good friend of mine, who's a, um, was mainly a translator, uh, and interpreter for the calls that we needed to do. We did interviews with a lot of Louis collaborators, um, everybody we could get, uh, at the, who was around at the time. And so Jacques helped with translation and interpretation. I wrote the text and I analyzed all but one of his films. There's one of his films that's still unavailable to anybody, and I was, I've never been able to get my hands on a copy of that. And uh, everything else we, we covered, uh, and um, it was a chapter by chapter, pretty much one film in each chapter. And um, the, one of the first, I think one of the one of the, one of the first uh, book length analyses of uh, all of his films in English. And what is it for you that brought you to the project? What was it about Louis Malle? 
Uh, well, I mean, Louie, I mean, just to give you some background, um, Louie was not, um, I mean, I've always been fascinated by iconoclasts, uh, cinematically and otherwise. And I think there's, uh, although I'm not going to poo-poo anybody associated with, with the French New Wave and produced some terrific directors, and I love Truffaut and Romare and all those guys, um, I, I think that there is something really interesting about the fact that, you know, the, those directors ascribe to the auteur theory, which basically meant that they tried to develop an artistic style and would, would, would create the same variations on the same film over and over again. At least that was the idea. They were all disciples of Andre Bazin, and um, and so that was Louis' criticism. He knew them; he was not part of them. And um, socially, he came from a different social strata, a different background, and uh, he, as a result, maybe as a result, he saw the world differently, and he did not want to make the same film over and over again. He was a student of Zen master. He became a student of Zen master Shun Ryu Suzuki. Uh, whose philosophy uh, was echoed in the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And Suzuki said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing this, but he said, in the beginner's mind, there are all possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are but a few. I have therefore decided to always be a beginner. So in Louis' case, and that was sort of his axiom, um, and he constantly reinvented himself. He never wanted to make the same film twice. And um, you can definitely see stylistic, th- you know, threads um, and uh, thematic threads in his work if you, if you dig. But that was not his his um, that was really not in his wheelhouse. He wanted to re- he wanted to make you know films in numerous styles and on numerous subjects. And so going from I think it was Pauline Kael who said that a new Matisse is as instantly as identifiable, uh, identifiable as anything, but how could you possibly identify Numal? He constantly changes. And as a result, he was dismissed as a dilettante. And I think that's um, really unfair because he produced, uh, he directed, and, and in some cases produced um, is some of the greatest French films and, and also you know, some great films in the U.S., uh, just terrific films. And I love that idea of the constantly expanding horizon the fact that he you know just saw limitless possibilities that's that's to me is extremely exciting the thing that's interesting to me is that he comes into his own around the time of the french new wave although his stuff has absolutely nothing really to do with what those guys are doing that's true yeah absolutely and it, and I think, um, you know, from what I know of him, and you can kind of help me, um, you know, talk about his early years, was he got into film originally working with Jacques Cousteau, right? He did. He was, uh, he was you know, born into wealth. He was, he, was the, he was the child of Francoise Beguin, who was the heiress to the Beguin beet sugar fortune. And so he never really had to worry about money. The family still has money. I mean, they're, they're very well to do. And, and, but Louis did not base bank, unlike Truffaut, for example, he did not use his own money, as far as I'm aware, to really get his career underway. It, it, the timing of his career is unbelievable. It's like opportunities just kind of fell in his lap. He went to, to IDHEC, which was the kind of premier film school in France, and one of the difficulties is in recounting, um, and everybody admits this, even his family, his daughter admits this, that one of the things that you have to do is, when you look at Louis' life, is take what he said you know, in retrospect with a grain of salt, because he would reinvent episodes from his life, and there have been things that he has claimed that other people have said, no, he's, he was a drama, uh, you know, sort of a drama queen. He, he, would, he would add dramatic details, and so I don't know that this is true. But as he told it, Jacques Cousteau approached the students at IDHEC and uh, said, who wants to come with me and film a sea voyage? Now, the reason I sort of am skeptical about this is because, in retrospect, it's difficult to imagine that a lot of people wouldn't have been interested in doing that as film students. But according to Louis' account, nobody else wanted to go. And he said, I, because nobody else wants to go, I will go. That, that's his version. So he, he said, and the, the proposal was basically Jacques made him a co-director on a documentary called The Silent World. Um, the Silent World... And the details, it's been a while since I've seen it uh, or written about it, but, but basically it's, it's a documentary of Cousteau's sea voyage. And he and Mahler listed as co-directors, and that is completely accurate because it's, it's not a particularly great film, but it's an interesting film because their styles clash with each other. Uh, Cousteau was, a, was a, a brilliant oceanographer. He was not a great filmmaker. He was a lot like... Um, he filmed things for documentaries in a very Disney kind of way. He was a sensationalist, and he 
you know, like to construct meaning out of images and, and to sort of uh, have, because have staged scenes and um, a little bit like Flaherty, but, but cuter. And Maul was very much about cinema direct and, and very much about letting things unfold before the lens and their styles clashed. And uh, despite the fact that it isn't, I think, a, a particularly great film and has scenes in it that Louis shot that were, that were fantastic and that really laid down his documentary style that would later prefigure in works like Phantom India and so forth, um, which I think is one of the greatest documentaries ever made that Louis made in India. Um, and uh, so Louis did that and with, with Jacques, and despite, despite the fact that uh, the film was itself was uneven, it went on to win the Golden Palm at Cannes. Uh, and these, you know, this is Louis Maul was at the time was 20, uh, let's see, he would be 20, he's born in 32, so he was 23 at the time. So this is one of, one of the youngest Golden Palm winners, certainly at that time and probably since, uh, in history. To be 23 and win the highest film award in the world, he could do whatever the hell he wanted. So he went back to Paris, he took some time off, um, and decided to bring a... Um, to, to, to basically uh, take a Roman policier, a noir novel, to the producer who had produced A Man Escaped, which was Jean Thulier. His Robert Brassens, A Man Escaped, was, it was a, you know, a huge hit at the time, an art house hit and, um, on the festival circuit. And, and Louis um, took this book and, and to Jean Thulier and said, I think, you know, are you interested in backing me? He's a Palm Door winner, so naturally the guy is, you know, paid attention and uh, read the book and said it's an interesting book. It has an interesting premise. What do you propose? And and Louis had said, and this is a novel by Noel Coleff. I don't think it's been translated into English. I, I've never been able to find an English copy. So, um, and it's I believe just a standard noir um, with kind of a clever plot. And Louis approached the novel. He said, I want to work with a novelist named Roger. Um, Nimier, who was a who was a sort of a brilliant young smart novelist, and Nimier read the book and hated it. And said, "This is you know crap, and why would you want to do this?" And Louis said, "I'm going to give you the freedom to. I, I want us to augment this, and 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 to play with with the contents and um, to expand on what's here." And Nimier said, "You know, if you give us give me that freedom, then I'm interested. Let's do it." So um, you know, the best way I think to approach the film is to look at it as um, you know, he, he's acknowledged that it's influenced by Hitchcock and Brisson, but I think that it's he, the better way to look at it is that he was doing what Hitch, Hitch did, uh, which was to take novels that weren't that highly regarded and expand on them and add to them and bring his own elements, you know, to to the fore. Um, so he took a noir and he kind of augmented it in a way, and it became something much greater than the original book. I understand the original book is not particularly great. Uh, the film is much richer and, and deeper than that, or at least so I'm told. I've not read the text, but but uh, that's certainly evident from what's on screen. Yeah, he's in his early 20s. He's not even 25 yet when he does Elevator to the Gallows, and there's certain things about it that are quite self-assured, um, one of which... And we'll get into this in a bit as the score, but I really wanted to talk about the casting because, I mean, Jean Moreau, I mean, she was just starting to really get her feet here, but really would get traction, I would say, into the 60s. And he's clarified this before, and Louis clarified this. You know, she was, she wasn't, she wasn't, this wasn't her debut. She was a B movie actress. Uh, and and uh, so he didn't discover her exactly, but at the same time, this movie really elevated her presence a lot and gave her a much higher profile. So when he was putting this together, as you said, he, he goes to uh, Brisson's um, uh, producer, and what was, from your research, what was his uh, amount of time that he had and what was he able to work with in order to put this together? Because it, um, I, I would say it's not a lavish production, but then again, it doesn't need to be. He filmed it on a, I, my understanding is that he filmed it on a, on a, on a low to moderate budget. It was, it was done on a low budget. He filmed it with Tri-X, which was, um, a very, I don't know about, the, about, the, about the time element. I know that it was released in France in early, I have to double check the dates, but I believe it was released in France in January or February of 1958. I believe so. Uh, and, uh, so that would be, if you mean, you know, between, the Silent World, which was May of 
released in May and get caught in May of '56. That's that's roughly a year and a half. So, I, I, but I don't know about how that actual schedule break, broke down as far as production is concerned. Um, I do know that he filmed it on a relatively low budget. He used Tri-X film, which was extremely controversial, uh, and because they were afraid that he would destroy Jean Moreau, who was then up and coming, uh, because they felt like he, he wanted to give it a very gritty look. He wanted to film it very naturalistically, so he wanted to light it with, in some cases, where she's wandering through the city uh, with only street light and not studio lighting. And that was very controversial, and, and he, there was a sort of a major outcry that he would you know, destroy her before she even became a star. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so my in- impression is that it was done on a very limited budget. Did you get a chance to speak with her or read uh, her take on taking part in the film? I read her take on, 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 on you know, being involved in the film. She's very, um, she's very elusive. She's one of the, one of the people. We, we got Bardot. We got Susan Sarandon. We could not get her. And, in fact, she's not even been in touch with the family or hadn't at the time since Louis' funeral. She's very um, withdrawn. And uh, I know they were involved romantically, too. I don't know if it has, it has something to do with that, but I know that she respected Louis a lot. She was at his funeral. She's not the most accessible person in the world. Other aspects of the of the crew and, and the people that worked on it, did you get a chance to speak with them at all? Uh, no. Part of the problem is that a lot of those people are no longer around. Dekai is dead. Um, the only person really from, from the Rene died, Maurice Rene the star. This is one of the, one of those issues where the film was so, was, is so old and certainly was, you know, even at the time we were writing the book, which was, you know, 15 years ago. Um, a lot of the people were gone. The only person who was still around, I believe, is Yori Bertin, who plays Veronique. So this is one of those cases where, and, and certainly the, the, you know, the screenwriter is, is long deceased and, uh, and uh, so it was, it was, and Miles Davis is gone. He was new to this course, so it was not really possible, you know, to, to get anybody who was involved. And Berton is not in the business anymore. She was not, it was not possible to locate her. So, so, did that answer your question about as far as, as far as, um, as far as the actual production itself? Uh, sure, unless um, there's additional uh, things you want to talk about in relation to it. Not really, except for the fact that the, you know, the story about, you know, and I, I do want to talk about the contents of the film and, and, and how I think, um, you know, that it, it figures into Louis's sort of progression as an artist. But uh, the only other thing I wanted to add as far as the production is just that, you know, uh, Quaddy, Louis's son, has told the story about how Louis got Miles Davis to score it and how it was done just impromptu. He, he found out that Miles happened to be in Paris giving a concert. He approached Miles and asked him to do it on the spot, and Miles and his, um, his, you know, his group basically agreed to do it right then and there and spent the following night recording music for the film, never having seen it, improvised the entire thing, and played until dawn. And uh, that, was, that was how the score was done. It was done entirely improvised. And was that any sort of particular reason as to why he picked him out? Was he a fan or just... He was an enormous fan, uh, and I, I do know that, and he was listening to it. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I really believe that, that, that this is a question of, of, you know, the jazz score feeding into, um, you know, we can talk more about this, about the themes of the film, because it's such a modern film on so many levels. I think it really works. Um, Louis would rarely discuss his reasons for making a particular choice. But if you look at the film, it's it's a film that's about modernity. It's a film about relationships that are broken. It's about you know the same thing that jazz is about. Um, it, that that sort of idea of you know of uh, being modern, of broken truth, and and uh, how can we you know um, how can we reconstruct a whole meaning and and so forth. So I think the jazz really contributes to that a lot. If that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. You know, the thing that's interesting is he decided to do basically sort of a genre picture in a way as his first film, but there is, as you said, this um, sort of tweaking of the genre. I mean, obviously pulling from uh, influence of of American film, film noir, things like that. What do you see that he brings to this conversation uh, when we talk about it in that way, those ideas that are uh, uniquely his own or uniquely sort of France in that era? I don't want to throw us too off course, but I really think that that that, that uh, excuse me. I really believe that 
that, that Elevator to the Gallows has to be looked at in tandem with another film that he made. Uh, he made another film with the same two cast members as Elevator, the two leads, Jean Moreau and Maurice René. Um, let's see, let's see, it would have been uh, six years later. Have you seen The Fire Within? No, I haven't. The Fire Within, I think, is, 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 is in many ways a sister film to Elevator to the Gallows. And I think that you have to look at both films, even though they were not made back-to-back. He made Zazita in the Metro. He made a couple of documentaries. He made um, uh, a very private affair with Mastriani and, and the lovers in between those two films. But those two films are sister films. I think that he... And Louis was a very philosophical guy. He was very interested in Jean-Paul Sartre. And um, he was very interested in existentialism, Kierkegaard, etc. And I think that there was a certain despair at the core of his life that anybody who knew him would tell you, tell you about. And I think that um, I think that that those elements, the, the elements in Elevator to the Gallows, um, that dwell on loneliness, that dwell on isolation, that dwell on the impossibility of ever knowing another person fully, that dwell on misunderstandings that can result from that. Um, that can, that, you know, that there's kind of an existentialist angst that lingers at the core of that film, and I think that it's um, those elements are used to augment the noir framework of the movie. Uh, so, in other words, you get this genre picture, like you said, but underneath it all, you get these very philosophical kind of um, undercurrents and these undercurrents of angst. And I think that the part of the sort of the genius of the film. Is that is that the noir elements, the crime framework, the genre framework, and the the philosophy that I mentioned intersect in really brilliant ways. And I'll give you a couple of examples. The fact that that uh, Maurice Rodin's character, you know, spends the, basically the entire film trapped in an elevator, trying to escape, I think, can be read pretty transparently as a symbol of the impossibility of, uh, you know, of of uh, of really getting out of the prison of the self, you know, the fact that we're, we're trapped inside of ourselves and we, we can never quite get out of that. I think it's a kind of a literal metaphor. I think also the fact that um, because of the weird kind of ironic set of circumstances that happens while he's trapped in the elevator with these young people stealing his car and these lovers and, and, and pretending the guy pretending to be him, that leads to Moreau, Moreau's character, um, you know, mistakenly thinking that, uh, in fact, her lover, uh, you know, Julian Tavernier, uh, has, in fact, fled with the flower girl. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so there's this, this series of misunderstandings that you can read as kind of staples of noir, um, but also philosophically, again, it's a commentary on the difficulty that we have of ever really knowing someone else. Um, there is also this wonderful Trump Loy that opens the film where you think you see her talking in, in tight close up to her lover and you believe they're in the room together and it pulls back and they're separated by technology. She's talking on the telephone. And, um, and in fact, they don't appear together in the film until the end where they appear uh, together in a, in a developed photograph that incriminates them. And it's, um, I think that's a really... I'm not going to say cynical, but I feel like it's a really bleak and really honest commentary on 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 the modern society that we live in and how it divides us. Um, and so, you know, I feel like he almost needed as as a debut, he needed those noir elements, those crime elements of the story, and you know, he needed those to make the film marketable. Um, I don't know that he would have felt comfortable making the fire within. But then six years later, he made what you could look at as Elevator to the Gallows without the noir. You know, and The Fire Within is, has no genre framework, uh, other than just being a, a psychological drama. It has no, no uh, you know, convenient narrative devices, no irony, you know, no uh, detective story, no crime, nothing like that. It's just an existentialist cry of angst. It's a cry of despair that is as sad and as heartbreaking as anything you've ever seen or experienced. And it would be unbearable, except for the fact that, and it's played by the same actor, uh, which I don't think is a coincidence. And Jean Moreau appears in a cameo scene as, as one of his ex-lovers. 
And although the characters are different that Rene plays, in The Fire Within, it's they're stripped of accoutrements, if that makes any sense. The, the elements are stripped of um, any genre trappings. And you just get this drama of um, a man who is basically um, a, a Jay Gatsby-like character who has just come out of detox in, in a sanitarium in Versailles, and he is looking for a reason not to kill himself. And it's 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 I think 48 hours in the last the 40 the 48 last hours in the life of somebody who has decided to commit suicide, and it's it's like a piece of music. He's spiraling downhill, and he stops at friend after friend after friend, looking for a reason to go on, and failing to find it, and becoming increasingly desperate, and eventually starts drinking again, goes into complete destruction, and it is. The full flowering of Louis' genius. It's the greatest movie he ever made. It's I don't say this often, Rob, but it's a perfect film. You cannot find anything wrong with this film, and other people who have seen it agree with me. So I think there is there is that kind of despair in flashes, at the, at, at the core of Elevator to the Gallows. But I don't think it's as unadulterated as as it was in, as it is in The Fire Within. And um, if that makes any sense, looking at the films back to back, it's like a one-two progression. And I think if the first work is a work of intelligence and sophistication and um, you know and, and uh, self assurance, the second work is 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 the one that can really be called genius. Um, and and seeing the back to back is extraordinary. It's like watching an artist blossom. You know, when we talk about film noir, it often plays out within the context of, you know, of war, the after war, um, and then some even will trace back to, you know, uh, post World War One and a lot of expressionist film and things like that. Do you feel that a lot of what he was dealing with in Elevator the Gallows was a personal thing, as you were talking about, his own personal, I guess, uh, psychological state, or was it more of him looking at the culture or the society in which he was in and sort of reflecting it back? I think it was a compromise <clears throat> between the two, and I don't mean that, that I think that it's necessarily um, that it should be disregarded as such, uh, but I think that it was a compromise. I think he was looking at, if I understand your correct question right, I think that he was uh, was a pretty, had some pretty dark parts of his own personality. Um, I think he was a really complicated guy. Um, in some ways, I, I, you know, studying somebody for four years and writing about them, you find out things you'd rather not know. Nothing too scandalous in his case, but I think I realized how complex he was from the beginning. And um, certainly not everybody who knew him was a fan. He has people who are still, you know, madly in love with him, um, who consider him a dear friend, and people who um, have, you know, sort of felt a sting. Uh, so he was a divisive character, and I think he was a really, really complicated guy. Uh, and I think that those elements found their way in, but I think as well, Elevator is a nod, and as a first film should be probably, to the commercial considerations of the period. And I think that he, like a lot of young directors, was influenced by, by Hitchcock, was influenced by American films, by crime films, and um, he's acknowledged that. Um, he's acknowledged, he's said that his two chief influences were Brisson, who was much more, even though Brisson was religious, he was Catholic and Louis was not. Uh, I think Brisson's um, kind of bleakness um, and maybe pragmatism about humanity was much more in tandem with with Louis than anything else. It's also there, he's also said that he that he was knowledge he, that he was influenced by Hitchcock, and uh, and so that I think was in, was a nod to sort of the commercial considerations of the period, post-war period in which this was made. And also I think, you know, even though we said he wasn't part of the new wave. Um, you know, it was done in a very, on, uh, you know, in a very, um, you know, grassroots kind of way, and and so even though you, you couldn't say he was the Nouvelle Vague director, there is still um, kind of a grassroots approach that's on view. It, it's not one of those films that was made with a with an Elephantine budget uh, and a lot of slick lighting. It was done with you know location lighting in a lot of cases and. Um, you know, on location instead of studio sets, and and uh, and as we've discussed, a pretty moderate budget, and that too, to me, was was very in vogue at the time. You know, given uh, what Truffaut and other people like that were doing. Today, people look at the film and go, "Wow, you know, this is a uh, quite an uh, quite an achievement for a young man in his mid twenties and first film." Yeah. Incredible. 
when it first came out, when you went and read the notices of, of that, if you have, uh, how was it received then? It was received well. Uh, I mean, it put Louis on the map. Uh, it won the pre-Louis de Luc, I believe. Um, and uh, and I I believe it opened the door for him to make the lovers. I think I think it was it was a it was a very well received film. That's my understanding. When you look at uh, the thematics and and various things that are at play in this film, how do they play out throughout the rest of his career? Do you find him asking the same questions, dealing with similar themes? Well, I mean, like I said, it, it Louis was difficult because because no, he he didn't all often explore the same themes, but. Um, there are some there are some themes that carried on. One of one of which we discussed. I mean, I think that that, that this kind of cry of spiritual despair echoed again in in um, in the fire within, uh, certainly. And um, I think also there was a relativism, kind of philosophically and spiritually, that is sort of hinted at in this film, that became much more prominent as his career went on. Um, what I mean is that. You know, here, you know, if you look at this film, I mean, it's it's a commentary on on I, the the book that I keep in is really a novella that I always think about when I think about Olivia or the Gallows is a novella by Henry James called In the Cage, which is the the novella about and was the banker who you know is, is sort of love struck by somebody who's coming in constantly and doesn't ever really find that 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 they can know that person. Um, and and uh, that that there's definitely a lot of overlap here, and, and you know you see that 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 idea of two people who you know are sort of madly in love on the surface, but there's this barrier dividing them. And uh, I think that if you if you dig a little bit, if you dig dig a little deeply, you can say that you know the Phantom India. Which was kind of the, the sort of the Louis Louis transformation. You know, Louis made Phantom India in '68, so it was just about a decade later, and that's one of the most relativistic films ever made. And saying that philosophically, he went to India and started directing, and just kind of let his cameras roll. And one of the sort of sort of ideas at the core of that movie is that we can never understand another culture fully. You know, especially a culture that's Eastern, that's so alien to us coming from the West. And that, uh, you know, relativistically, how could we say there's one belief system uniting everything, one philosophy, when a culture is so different from ours that you don't even know that two plus two is four? So if you look at this, that is an extension of this. You can say that here in, in Elevator, he was looking at it on an interpersonal level. You know, can we ever fully know each other? Um, you know, and could we ever have a shared consciousness? Perhaps not likely not and in in phantom india it becomes cultural it becomes much broader and um you know he's saying that that that, that kind of a wall exists between cultures as well uh, philosophically and i think then that bleeds into a whole period where he was kind of upending western values um he you know he started to take deliberately contrarian stances on a lot of values that people in the west a uh, whole year um, by making movies that that took accepting values toward incest, toward and accepting and empathetic values toward child prostitution, cocaine dealing in the case of Atlantic City. So I think I think that if you look at it in that way, you could say that that um, that those films in turn were were an outgrowth of Phantom India. And and he, he you know he, he went as a skeptic. He came back as a relativist. He said that. And his next film was Murmur of the Heart, which is kind of the most polite view of incest ever filmed. It's, it's almost almost embraces it as, um, you know, just one of the frivolities of, of the bourgeois in France. Um, and uh, it takes a very accepting, very polite view. And for that reason, it caused a lot of controversy. So he became a relativist. And, and I think that you can see the seeds of that as early as, as Elevator to the Gallows. You know, he's one of the major directors that I think of who has done both documentary and uh, fiction features. You know, usually people kind of uh, end up steering into one track or the other. And what do you find as a crossover between the two? Are there certain ideas that uh, he brings across in the documentaries, or are they totally foreign and look like they'd be made by someone completely different? There's definitely a connection. I think it's what I just said. I mean, I think it's basically he is, you know, he... You know, 
<clears throat> he went to make Phantom India. That was his first major documentary. And that's, if you haven't seen that, and Grid Criterion did a beautiful um, release of that. I believe they released that through their Eclipse series uh, and a box it with his documentaries. He, uh, he made that. And, you know, he, he went as a skeptic. Uh, he had, he had left, um, he had a Catholic mother, but he disdained Christianity early on and was very, very, very left wing in terms of, in terms of, you know, not, uh, embracing kind of, um, um, a very left of center, I should say, in terms of not not embracing kind of a Judeo Christian worldview, but that intensified when he went to India, and I think that um, he came back from India not knowing if he even still wanted to be a filmmaker. He said that it turned his his perception of ethics and morality on onto its head, and I came back thinking, do I even want to continue in directing? Because what do I do after this? I've kind of traveled to the ends of the earth. I've kind of gone as far as philosophy can go in terms of agreeing that there are no absolutes. Uh, what do I do now? And he immediately kind of went into this mode where he, he was trying to make a film about, um, uh, I believe, and I'm forgetting who the collaborators were now because they never got made, he was trying to make a film about utopian societies, um, similar to, I don't even know if it would have been similar, but I mean, I guess thematically similar to Lost Horizon or something like that. And then he realized that it wouldn't work because, um, you know, there's no conflict in, in a utopian society and there's no way to sustain that. And then he kind of went back to Georges Bataille, who had written this book called Ma Mère, um, which is about incest. And I believe the book ends with a suicide. I'm not sure about that, but I believe so. And he started writing this treatment of incest. And he started to re-examine the bourgeois. And I think um, Buñuel, Buñuel and, and, and some of these guys who were, um, who were satirists, uh, looking at the bourgeois, there is definitely an element of um, critique, um, one might even say ridicule. In Louis' case, he's empathetic. That's the difference. He started to see in the hypocrisy of the bourgeois the seeds of utopianism. By, by saying that the bourgeois was hypocritical, or, you know, is hypocritical, certainly at that time, um, and seeing the sort of moral hypocrisy, he thought, he, well, he set out to basically make a film of the world in a way that it doesn't really work, according to what we know. And so he, he had a com- made a comedy about incest that ended with uh, a kid and his mother sleeping together, and they have a laugh about it, and the movie's over. There's no, he started in it with a suicide, and he said that was his Western inclination. I know, this has to end with suicide, with guilt, with Western morality, and then he shook it off and got rid of it and, and wrote it as a comedy with a happy ending. And the happy ending is they have sex and they walk away and the kid is healthier. The world doesn't really work that way. But I think Louis was, I, you know, I think that was, I don't know if I'm being clear about this, but I think that was definitely, he has said in interviews that it was definitely a product of his Indian experience. And so I think that that, that experience made his films morally looser and freer and expanded his ability to go to places that he couldn't have otherwise gone. He made Pretty Baby with Bert Shields as a child prostitute. It's not a particularly good movie, but it, it's noteworthy because it's the only film I can think of, only commercial film, that, that doesn't um, damn child prostitution. It looks on its characters fondly, and it takes an embracing view, and that was widely controversial, as you can imagine. And then Atlantic City with the cocaine dealing, which is viewed as a positive force in the life of its characters, um, and and so on and so forth. And um, you know there are even you can see, you know in in May Fools, which is a great great comedy that he made in the, in the late in late eighties, he also investigates utopia. You know why is it possible for the bourgeois, as materialistic as they are, you know to basically set up their own utopia and how long can that last? These are all sort of moral concerns of this. Is it possible for us to break away from the morality with which we're raised, you know, that, that he saw as a social construct? Um, and, uh, you know, that's certainly worthy of, of, of debate. I don't know if I would take the same tack or not, but that's, that's definitely the, the, the place that he was at. And um, I also think there was another connection, too. Louis was never someone who worked well in, in studio settings. All of his major studio films, um, I mean, Atlantic City is a great film, but it was financed by Dennis in Winnipeg, uh, by the Canadian Tax Shelter. All of his major movies, Pretty Baby, uh, Alamo Bay, 
uh, crackers is a disaster um, that were made under the thumb of a studio don't really work. And I think you work best, um, you know, with, with light equipment, um, kind of doing, an exercise, you know, kind of undertaking a cinematic exploration. And he has said a lot of times that documentary became his salvation from studio filmmaking. Whenever he became tripped up with, with a project that didn't work, um, he would then return to uh, documentary filmmaking with a 16 millimeter camera and travel around to various places and explore. He was an explorer above all else. And I think that documentary filmmaking was his respite from, um, you know, from, uh, from studio conventions. I think it saved him in a lot of ways. It was kind of his salvation. You mentioned at the beginning that there's a film of his that you haven't had a chance to see because it's still under lock and key in some manner. Well, it's not really under lock and key. In fact, I could see it. I, I just, I never have. I have a friend who has a copy. It's very, very difficult to get to get my hands on. Criterion has never released it. It, it was a film that he made for uh, someone who has chosen not to be publicly identified. I think through research I've discovered that that's probably Dominique Sanda. It was a film made in 1976 called Close Up. And it's a, it's a cinema direct movie. It's a documentary about Dominique Sanda and her stardom. She had, she had been in Bresson's film uh, Un Femme Douce, um, I think in 69 or 70. And um, it's just a portrait of her that was made for uh, one of the French television networks. It's 26 minutes long, I think, or 25 minutes long. And um, I, his son, is, Louis son, has told me that someone shows not to let anyone see it. There are bootlegs circulating, and I know some of you has a copy. I've just never really to. They really pursued that, you know, just because of the wishes of the family. They don't want it to be out and seen, and so I, you know, just out of respect for them, I chose not to include it in the book. It just seemed like a like a wise thing to do. If that makes sense. One of the films of his, and like I said, I've only seen uh, maybe a handful. So there's uh, many that you've introduced me to tonight, and one that um, I think maybe captures the the popular imagination in America because it is basically two guys sitting at a table and talking is oh, yeah. My Dinner with Andre. Fantastic, yeah. And was just going to ask about that, and from your research, um, you know, how did how did this come to be? My Dinner with Andre, uh, it came about, <clears throat> there is a woman who... <laughs> Now, now, you're, now you're challenging my memory, because uh, it's been a while. Um, uh, Wally Sean and Andre Gregory were working on a play called Our Late Night. It, I think, was... Um, and, of course, they've gone on to... Andre Gregory is still active. He's, you know, in his 80s now, and he's amazing. And he, he founded the Manhattan Project. And Andre had dropped out of society in the 70s and um, became really disenchanted with the way that that things were evolving. He felt that Western culture was basically dead. Uh, Andre was a real visionary. It wasn't his, a real visionary. He would stage productions that kind of broke the fourth wall and uh, with his theatrical troupe, The Manhattan Project. And at some point, he felt that he reached his, the end of his, um, you know, of his theatrical career, at least, at least for the foreseeable future. And he, he, you know, he was, he's a wealthy guy, he had family money, and he decided to drop out and do something similar to what Louis had done. And he decided to, to explore different cultures and different religions and just sort of travel around the world as a kind of, um, you know, um, almost, um, I don't want to say mystic, but um, definitely an explorer. And uh, became something of a guru, and became involved in some of the paratheatrical cults in the 70s that you know that, that involved actually transcending the theater and dropping out. And he and Wally started talking and recording conversations, and um, and reasoned at some point that it would make a really interesting film. Or um, at some point, I believe they started videotaping it, and Wally started reshaping. The dialogues that 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 Andre he and Andre have had, um, and not doing it as documentary, but doing it as within as within a screenplay framework, and you know in a framework where they're playing characters, um, and uh, they definitely have motivations and arcs and and so forth. So it was done as this really unusual script, and Louis was not involved in the beginning. What had happened was that I believe he met Wally when Wally was in Atlantic City. Uh, Wally is a waiter in that film, in the seafood restaurant where Burt Lancaster takes Susan, Susan Sarandon. And um, 
at some point, uh, Wally and Andre were sat down to talk about, you know, this bizarre script that they had, which, um, you know, and, and asking them so, each other the question, you know, it's just a script with two people talking who in the world would be crazy enough to take this and discussing different directors. And I remember the quote because Andre said, you know, we, we, we said, well, maybe we could do Bergman, but he's not hired bring, bring Bergman in to direct this, but he's not funny enough. Or we could bring Woody Allen in, but we don't know if he's profound enough, et cetera. And at some point they, they happened upon Louis. I don't remember the connection. It may have been on, on, the, on the set of Atlantic City, or it may have been that Wally circled back around him, but I do know that he got a copy of the script. He was married to Candy Bergen at the time. They just got married, and they were going to the opera, and he picked her up and said, I just read the most brilliant script ever, and even the greatest director in the world, how in the world would I sustain 90 minutes of or more talking heads? And she said he was just fascinated by it. One of the things that, that, that came to light again and again is that he loved to tackle projects that he didn't know if he could do. Um, for instance, there is a, a, an unrealized adaptation of Baron in the Trees by Italo Calvino that Louis spent years trying to make, but he couldn't figure out how to film it because this is before CG. And, uh, you know, and so uh, I think he found it a challenge. Again, I don't remember how they connected exactly with Louis to direct this, but I do know they, they, they sent him the script and it became immediately intrigued and uh, the rest is kind of history. I think it was brought to life, too, by a producer named George George, as I recall. And there was a woman involved, too, and I'm blanking on her name, but um, they, they're the ones who, who put up the money and it got made and it became an art house hit. And he, they, of course, worked together again on Vanya on 42nd Street, which is a whole other kind of ball of wax and that was Louis's last film that came out in 94 so they, they remained close over the years when you look out at uh, all the films that he did he did quite a few uh what are some of the ones that you know you tell people you know you really if you haven't had a chance to get into his work or you've only seen a couple these are the ones that you should really seek out and they're worth your time Again, I think The Fire Within is the greatest thing he ever did. I mean, it's an amazing picture. If you haven't seen it or if any of your listeners haven't seen it, it's released on Criterion. It's very unusual. Um, it it came out only briefly in the U.S., and the timing was awful. I mean, it's a film about a suicide, a, a guy who's going, going to shoot himself. And there's no question that that's how he's going to end it. It makes it clear from the beginning. And uh, it was actually remade loosely. as I don't know if you saw Oslo, August 31st. Did you see that? No. It's the Joaquin Trier, Trier film that came out a few years ago, and, and the movie that almost everybody loved, I didn't care for it as much. But um, it's just, it's perfect. It's uh, Fire Within is. It's, um, you know, aesthetically, it's done in a way that is, it's done with this very high contrast black and white cinematography, and the music of Eric Satie, the piano music of Eric Satie, and they, those, um, intersect and give the film a lyricism that's just transcendent. I mean, just scenes of him looking out of windows and watching life unfold in the distance set to this very elegiac piano music by Sati, filmed in this gorgeous icon, black and white, and beneath it all is, is just this profound riff on on the, you know the angst of being human and being alone, and it's it just gives you the chills. It's done in an almost... It's one of the only movies I've ever seen, Rob, that doesn't have an emotional subtext. It operates in... It, it, it isn't depressing because it operates almost in a state of suicidal numbness. And it pulls you into his void and, and the impossibility that he experiences of ever having any emotion. And, um, and so I, I think it's a perfect film. I mean, a lot of people have said that, too. It's just a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. I mean, certainly you mentioned My Dinner with Andre, uh, which is such a remarkable feat that he could film those two guys talking and find a way cinematically and make it interesting. I love Atlantic City, um, you know, which is, he and John Guare were great friends. And Guare is still, I mean, I think Guare considers him, you know, a soulmate in some ways. Guare's still around and a great playwright. And that's Burt Lancaster, and Susan Saran. And it's kind of a, it may be an interesting uh, companion piece to Elevator because it too is kind of a noir. But it's a comic noir, and it's Burt Lancaster as an elderly uh, loser, basically, who has built his life on the fact that he um, has this self-mythology of being a gangster that has no foundation at all because he once shared Bugsy Siegel's cell, 
and uh, he dreams of being a gangster day and night, and, and fate drops that opportunity in his lap, and he gets the opportunity to be a hero and to sort of briefly live that out. And so it's very guare. Um, it's very quirky and kind of offbeat, and um, those are, I think, my three favorites. And then the other one is, you know, that, sh- that we've talked a little bit about is that, that I think is just, you know, one of the greatest documentaries ever made is Phantom India. And it's a whopping, you know, nine and a half hour, I believe it's nine and a half hours, trip through India. And it's, <clears throat> in, in some ways, it echoes everything we've been talking about. It's, it's a film with very, very little explanatory narration that takes you through um, India from city to city as he wanders with his crew, his three-person crew, uh, just witnessing these events and commenting kind of obliquely on the inability of him as, himself as a Westerner to understand what's going on. And so it becomes not only a travel, it becomes something much more than a travel log. It becomes a meditation on the impossibility that we feel in the face of another culture that's so Byzantine and so alien. And there are moments in that film when you forget you're watching a film. You know, that, that there is the moment that is the, one of the scariest things I've ever seen in a movie, uh, where he meets someone who he, he believes is possessed, who seems to be looking straight through the film at the viewer. And I mean, it's, it's chilling. I, I can't even tell you what this is like. You feel like he's looking at you as you're watching it. And then it has one other moment that I won't give away that's one of the most erotic things I've ever seen in a documentary. It involves a dancer. So that's amazing. And Criterion, um, you know, fortunately released that, and, and that's, it was unavailable for so long. Um, it's one of the few films of that length that's really worth, you know, committing that much time to. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, almost a spiritual experience to watch it, if, if that makes sense. When you look at um, him as an artist and look at, other filmmakers, where do you feel you see his influence? Gosh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I feel like he's underappreciated still. I don't know. I mean, you know, there are flashes. I, I, I watched a movie, um, you know, I th- it's an interesting question. I, I don't know. I mean, in the case of My Dinner with Andre, you could say that, that you can make an argument for the fact that it influenced a whole group of kind of experimental films from Derek Jarman with his blue to, uh, to Henry Jaglum, who was a friend who was friends with Candace uh, Bergen. Um, you know, his films from the eight mid eighties on became, and I, I like uh, a fair number of Henry's films. Uh, but, and so I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but they became very dialogue heavy. Uh, and some people have called them talkathons. I think they're, they're much better than that label would imply. But, uh, but they became, it's hard for me to, to imagine those films existing, um, you know, without my dinner with Andre. And in fact, Andre Gregory is in the first movie of his that falls into that category, which is always, he plays the party philosopher. So you can argue that, that, that it had a tremendous impact on that. You could argue that, um, that, uh, um, Burnt Copra's movie Mind Walk was influenced very heavily by by my dinner with Andre. That's also an extended discussion. So little examples here and there. Um, I saw a movie by Cedric Lapiche a few years ago called Paris uh, with, I believe, Juliette Binoche is in there. And I saw um, a reference in that film to The Fire Within. Um, but I still feel like his films are underappreciated. I don't feel like... Um, you know, because he's so elusive, because he doesn't have a consistent style, it's difficult to look at him and say, like you could look at, say, Godard and say, I see Godard's influence here and there. Um, I think it's more, you know, more scattered in Louis' case because, because you know, he did so many different things. I'm not sure that, um, that I see a running influence, you, you, know, uh, or, you know, that I can pinpoint. And maybe that's, I don't know if that's... that's uh, that's, that's surprising or not, but I'd have to think more about it, I guess. Anything you want to add that maybe I forgot to ask you about in relation to Louis Mall or where people can pick up the book? Uh, no, the, the book is available online, and it's available in a paperback now. Um, it was published by McFarland in, in 2005, and, um, you know, it's, uh, the paperback is the one to get because it, it, uh, it has some errors that are corrected in the text, and that came out, I think, four or five years ago, so you can still get that on Amazon, and it's called The Films of Louis Mall, A Critical Analysis. And, um, I, you know, it just suggests that, he, you know, it's, he's a great filmmaker because he's he's so consistently good, and not everything is worth seeing. Alan LeBay is a wreck. Crackers is a wreck. 
Um, I think uh, he would he would have told you. In fact, I know he said in interviews that a very private affair was a mess. Um, so he had films here and there that were duds. But um, one of the things that strikes me and struck me with writing the book and, and, and occurs to me now is just how incredibly consistent he was. You can probably go into, uh, you know, uh, you know, on the Netflix or Amazon and, and find copies of his films, and barring the ones I've mentioned, pick out anything and, and enjoy it on its own terms. I don't know very many directors about whom you could say that or make that claim. Thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure, Rob. Thank you. and I uh, write about jazz as an avocation. I'm a, a linguist at the University of Toronto. Now, as for your book on Miles Davis, uh, can you tell me what it is and how it came about for you? That's right. Uh, the, the book uh, is called Milestones, and it came out originally in two volumes a long time ago now, and then it was uh, squashed together into a single volume in the Decapo paperback, which is the current edition of it. So, so you get... Uh, the complete life of Miles Davis in uh, one big fat paperback at, from DeCapo. So it's, it's in print. It's been in print continuously since the 1980s. What was it about Miles Davis that was interesting to you? And as you said, it was originally two volumes. I mean, obviously spent a lot of time researching. It, it yes, it was. I mean, totally interesting because. Uh, uh, when I was a high school boy, I, I, I came upon Miles Davis's music, and it was a wonderful time. For Miles Davis, with the the, the uh, nineteen middle nineteen fifty quintet with John Coltrane, and then there the magnificent nineteen fifty eight sextet with Jul- Cannonball Adderley as well as Coltrane, and of course those Gil Evans uh, orchestrations with nineteen piece orchestra featuring Miles the Porgy and Bess and 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 Miles Ahead, and eventually uh, uh, the Spanish one. Um, so it was a great time for, for Miles Davis. He was at the, the top of his game. And in fact, the, uh, the music that we're going to talk about today, the soundtrack for Ascenseur pour les Chiffaux, uh, Elevator to the Scaffold, is, um, is also just a, a, a magnificent piece of, of music, improvised music. So, so I was interested in, in him from that time and thought he should have, he should be, much better known than he is. He should be like a, a, a cultural icon because of the way he was accomplished, accomplishing the music. And I just started gathering clippings from the time I was in high school. So by the time I became a, um, by the time I settled down with a family and had some writing time, um, I, I had a ton of stuff that nobody else had because it was such an ephemeral kind of existence. Uh, uh, you know, I had clippings of of various kinds of shootings and arrests and and other kinds of things that Miles Davis was involved in that that really weren't part of uh, the public record anywhere else but in my book. So that was uh, that 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 was how it all started. I just accumulated a ton of stuff and then made it more systematic. And since I'd been following his music um, you know, for for many for over a decade, by the time I wrote the book and knew everything about it, uh, I was in very good position. The, the, the book is now like, it's, it's being, it, it has been treated for a long time like a kind of encyclopedia of Miles Davis. People rifle through it and, and, and get details and, uh, that otherwise aren't available. Now, he was still around at the time. Did you get an opportunity to chat with him, or did he not take part? I, he did not take part. I I tried very hard, and, and in fact was quite tight with his uh, manager at, at at the time of the publication of the of the, of the first volume, and and um, was I sort of uh, pleaded with him because Miles was in the hospital for one of his various ailments at the time when the manager had delivered the first volume of my book, which was published in Canada before it was published in the United States, and and so the manager had delivered volume one of, of my biography to him in the hospital. And that the very next day, I met the manager, not in New York, but in Philadelphia. Turned out we'd both been on the train from New York to Philadelphia. 
uh, for for this meeting that we were having at his office in Philadelphia. And uh, but he said no. It, he he said every time I asked him, he said it would not be gratifying for you. That's what he kept saying. So so it never happened. And uh, I, I I regret that. I think it would have been gratifying, no matter how insulting or uh, whatever it was that Miles Davis was expected to do. Anyway, there's a nice anecdote. The uh, and the manager, his young manager at the time, walked into the um, hospital room where Miles was in the December, uh, whatever year that was, um, in the 1970s, and 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 handed him the first volume of my book. And he said, Miles grabbed the book out of his hand, and turned his back to him in the bed, and didn't talk to him for the rest of the time. So the manager sat there for three quarters of an hour. Uh, chatting, trying to make conversation, not getting any response, and then left. He was he was a um, a salty fellow. Uh, Miles Davis was he he had his own way of doing things, of course. As for the the book, you said you know it started as a fan, and you know you just being into his work and collecting these clips. What was it that really resonated with you in terms of him, and where do you sort of see his place when we talk about sort of uh, jazz in America, especially post-war jazz? Well, I, I mean, I think he's the uh, primary figure in in post-war jazz from in the music that came after bebop. I mean, he was a, a, a prime contributor to bebop too, as a very young player beside Charlie Parker, but. In in uh, the music that came next, the cool jazz movement and then the hard bop movement, and eventually the fusion uh, movement. Miles Davis was uh, a, a crucial uh, contributor to all of those genres. He was uh, the leader in in all of those. Well, maybe not the, the leader in hard bop, but but certainly along with with guys like Art Blakey and Clifford Brown, he he was one of the leaders and had a, he had a great band at at, at that time too. So, I mean, as far as giving the music direction, there's, I think, no doubt in anybody's mind that, that he was the one who gave it most direction through the second half of the of the 20th century. Uh, but more than that, I mean, I, I, what really I think is important about Miles Davis is the amazing articulateness of of, of his playing. He 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 reveals uh, feelings and moods more articulately and more more stunningly than anybody almost anybody else we can we can think of he had had a, a wonderful knack for choosing exactly the the right notes and and for expressing uh, emotions though i mean singers ex- express emotions by using words but it's a much deeper kind of expression that comes when, from music which which is a, a, an appeal that goes deeper than words can go in, into our psyche and and Miles Davis was, it was just a, a master of that. Everybody uh, envied him that, and and lots and lots of people learned from him uh, in in that way as far as possible. And as for that, does that have to do with his early years, his early training? I mean, it's my understanding. Um, as a kid, was it uh, Kansas City? He was raised uh, learning classical music, correct? It was St. Louis. Yeah. Okay. And, but um, it was, and, and in fact, it was East St. Louis is, is where he was born and raised. But but he he did his early playing in in St. Louis across the river from East St. Louis, and and at that time, I mean, he was, he was just an ordinary kid. He was a high school graduate uh, when he left for New York City, and when he went to New York City, then he he went because he was enrolled in the Juilliard School of Music, which was. A pretty good accomplishment and uh, one that at the time cost a lot of money but for an african-american um, lad it was it, it was a, a particularly um, interesting kind of environment so he went to Juilliard and and did learn a few lessons there but he also of course was hanging out on 52nd Street where bebop was flourishing and and he had already made acquaintances with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie in, when he was still in St. Louis, and, and they welcomed him when he showed up in New York City. He was a young man with an allowance, which uh, made Charlie Parker very pleased. And in fact, Charlie Parker added him to his band as the regular trumpet player um, just a few years after he arrived. 
So this period in, what was this, the early 50s, late 40s? When exactly? It was, it, yeah, it, it was um, uh, in the early, early, late 40s, early 50s. That's right. It was, uh, he arrived in 1947 in New York City and played in Charlie Parker's quintet in, throughout 1958, made the birth of the cool recordings in 1959 and 60. Uh, and, and so uh, 19, uh, yeah. And, and so all of, all of the, those formative periods, I mean, he always said, Miles always said that he learned more from Dizzy Gillespie about harmonics and um, playing the chord changes and, than he did for, at, at Juilliard. But we, we don't know. He, he at least had um, his foot in both camps. He was uh, unique in that way, too. His uh, his playing doesn't betray uh, a, a lot of erudition. There's a there's a kind of a, a natural feel that he has for the music all the way through, and that uh, that, that sort of belies any kind of, of of erudition. So when he pioneered modal jazz with Birth of the Cool and before that with the recording milestones in in 1958 and 1959. That that was a, a considerable change in the uh, harmonic structure that jazz musicians were used to, but Miles didn't rationalize that. He didn't talk about it. He didn't academicize it in any way. Uh, his friend George Russell and his piano player Bill Evans they were more likely to talk about uh, the underpinnings of the music than Miles was. But Miles was was very much the leader, uh, the one who who made that shift in, in, in the harmonic state of jazz, he made it work. You know, this period that we're talking about with uh, Elevator to the Gallows, the Louis Malle film, um, can you kind of give me some background into how it came to be that he came on to the attention of Louis Malle, this is his first film, and that he said to him, let's just do this improv score. So he actually projected the film to his band and they played several different takes and there was the score. That's exactly right. Yeah. Louis Mal was very young uh, and it was his first feature film, but he had uh, direct previously directed a, a long and very popular uh, documentary with Jacques Cousteau had traveled with Jacques Cousteau, the underwater dr- diver who uh, has, has had a, a Tremendous influence on on oceanography and and other kinds of of um, adventures, sort of sea to sea seaside adventures. And Louis Malle had had directed that, and it was the success of that documentary that, that gave him sort of carte blanche. He was allowed then to do pretty much what he wanted as a director. So he had a rapid rise right into the front ranks of of the French film industry, and his first. Uh, uh, feature was was elevated to the scaffold with um, Jean Moreau, who was already an up and coming star, recognized far and wide as an up and coming star. So he got the best actress at the time, and it was proposed to him by the promoter of Miles Davis. Miles Davis was on a three week tour um, of of uh, France uh, at the time. Without his band, he was there as an individual playing with a pickup band, and he had played with some members of the pickup band, the French guys, the year before when he he, he made a, a tour called Jazz for Moderns. So he knew the piano player Rene Ertige, and and he knew the bassist Pierre Michelot. They were they were both members of the band that accompanied him the summer before, and and so he went back there to. Uh, to do some concerts with a French band. As it happened, there was a gap in his schedule and the promoters went, the promoter went to Louis Mal and said, what about using Miles Davis on the soundtrack of, of this film noir that you're making? And, and Louis Mal, because he had a, an open mind, he had an open mind all his career. He was a wonderful director. Uh, he, he invited him in and what we discovered many years later, after the after the soundtrack became a, a kind of um, an iconic item in the history of jazz and film, um, what we discovered was that Louis Mal had taken Miles into a projection room 
soon after he arrived in Paris and shown him clips and explained what was going on in the in the clips. So he showed him unedited uh, versions of the of some of the scenes, and Miles made notes about what kind of music he thought might work there. Then he went off and played for three weeks with this French band, Barney Weiland, uh, who's actually an American, but living in Paris and never did come to America, uh, as tenor, on tenor saxophone, Barney Weiland, uh, only 20 years old at the time. And then uh, uh, René Ertergé, the piano player, Pierre Michelot, the bassist, and the great American drummer, Kenny Clark, an expatriate who had been living in Paris then for five years. Um, and, and with this band, they played night after night after night at, uh, in concert halls and, and in clubs. And when it came time for them to make the soundtrack, they went into a studio, and Louis Mal ran the film, and he had it on loops, had the scenes that he thought needed music on loops, so that they would work, uh, look at the film, Miles would direct the musicians, uh, tell 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 him tell them what he wanted, and they simply recorded it, and in in that amazing way. So they were in this studio, watching the looped clips, playing the music, recording the music for for four hours altogether, and one hour of music has uh, has survived uh, from that. Well, only only 27 minutes or something like that are actually on the soundtrack, but the with the outtakes and so on that are now available um, in the on the CD version, there's a, a ton of music. They were very very productive, and it was because of course they were so compatible, having worked together so closely for the previous three week, three weeks, and it was a unique way of 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 scoring a film. People to this day. I don't think anybody has done it that way. And it's reminiscent to me of of the way people used to uh, score, or not score really, but uh, accompany silent films. So there was a tradition uh, in the 1920s and 30s uh, of having organists or piano players in the pit while a silent film was playing and have them accompany the images on the screen. Uh, so you got the, the William Tell Overture, you got it every time there was a horse race, and that, that kind of thing. And Fats Waller and many other people, uh, Count Basie as a young man, they actually participated in that. They played or, the organ at, at huge movie theaters and accompanied silent films. Well, that's sort of what Miles Davis was involved in with, with Elevator to the Scaffold. He was um, watching the action and orchestrating the action in a very spontaneous way. I mean, he had some notes that guided him, but mainly it was spontaneity and, and wonderful, wonderful creative music. The thing that's interesting to me is I'm, I, I think that even if you're not a huge jazz fan, you may know Kind of Blue, which came out a year after this. Exactly. Film. Yeah. And to me, it seems that the score for this film and kind of blue tonally, there's there's similar elements. He's he's working in this certain period. And what kind of elements do you see as maybe uh, in this score and then also in in that, you know, iconic classic uh, album? I, I, I think you're exactly right. And in fact, some of the. Um, pieces that, that were recorded for Elevator to the Scaffold have the same kind of tonal organization as Miles Davis would later use in, in Kind of Blue, and which, which means that the musicians were instructed to play melody without regard for chord changes. It must have been a, a real challenge, and the piano does, in fact, lay out quite often because the piano, of course, is a chordal instrument, uh, and the piano lays out every now and then. And, and so there's a sense of Miles Davis's melodic lines floating above, above the, the steady rhythm, the, particularly the, in this case, the brushwork of, of Kenny Clark, the great, great drummer. And, uh, and, and that same... So I think what you notice about Birth of the Cool that, that is reminiscent of the, of the soundtrack recording is, 
is that that kind of melodic floating fear feeling of, uh, that, that Miles Davis gets the kind of atmospheric sense and it's very much there in in the soundtrack in the best parts of the soundtrack and and it's there throughout the recording of of kind of blue you're 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 right Rob when you say uh, that, that kind of blue is one that people know it's it's been uh, the best selling jazz record for years and years and years so it's if, if people only own one real jazz recording it's it's almost certainly going to be kind of blue what was it do you feel that he was working on in this era i mean i mean later we get into the fusion stuff and i know that pretty well you know bitches brew and all of that but what was it in this period this late 50s period that he was kind of working out on those records and then also would you say on the film well, uh, he, it was a period of great inspiration uh, from Miles Davis, this, this period of the late 50s. Uh, he, he had discovered the music of a piano player named Ahmad Jamal, who was a relatively unknown Chicago guy, working out of Chicago. He's a Pittsburgh guy, but he was working out of Chicago. And Ahmad Jamal, who has, has many recordings from this period that are extant as well, Miles Davis was his number one fan, and it was it was from Mama Jamal that Miles Davis increased this sense of um, calm and and rest and playing fewer notes than 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 were accustomed, especially in the in the bebop days with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. They, they those guys had played many many notes, and Miles Davis was interested in paring that down and making a statement with many many fewer notes. So he was inspired by that. He was inspired by uh, the Gil Evans recordings with the orchestra that were about to come out. He was um, happily married for a few, at least for the next several years. To, uh, Francis, his, his wife, was a, had been a dancer. And, uh, and they were happily married and had a wonderful uh, brownstone in, in New York City. So it was a, a wonderful settled time of Miles Davis's life and and that's why the I think the the music reaches a kind of a, a consummation uh, in these years from 1957 to 1960 or 61 um and 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 the soundtrack recording is is right at the beginning of that um, that wonderful time that he that he had and so he he was in charge of his art he was confident fully confident that, that what he played would, would be of interest to everyone and what he played would be um, um, felt and articulated in exactly the way he wanted it. This um, kind of improvisation that made up the soundtrack, when you listen to the music on the soundtrack, it, there's nothing that's sort of ad lib about it except for the, the feeling of freedom. But But there are wonderful melodies being um, invented, created right, right before your very eyes, right before your very ears. And of course, they're there because of Louis Mel's very sensitive black and white images on the screen. So that when you watch the movie, you think Jean Moreau never looked so melancholy. Well, it's partly because Miles Davis is playing this amazing blues, this beautiful blues called Florence sur les Champs Elysees. Elysees, it's a beautiful blues. While while the camera pans on on Jean Moreau as she walks the streets of of Paris in the rain, searching for her lover who is uh, stuck in an elevator, as it happens, which is what the what what the title means. So the lift. Uh, to the to to the scaffold, uh, elevator to the scaffold. So the it, the secret of of Miles Davis at this this time is 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 just a sense of well being, this total confidence that um, he had mastered um, all of the rudiments of of the art of jazz, playing beside the genius Charlie Parker and hanging around with people like Dizzy Gillespie and Ted Dameron and others. And he, he, had, he had mastered all of that and was now in charge of the art, his art and, and in fact, the whole movement. You know, jazz is a score element in film noir crime film. is always 
it, it always seems to be there, and it almost seems to be there to a point of cliche. Uh, what do you think he does in here that maybe turns it on its head or moves it forward to say, you know, yeah, okay, you may want to put jazz underneath a, a film noir, but um, here's here's a new way to think about it. That yeah, I think the, the jazz as a soundtrack art, which was very current at the time. I mean, there were there were television programs like Peter Gunn that had very nice big band jazz scores. That and the big band jazz scores accompanied murders and mayhem and car races and all of those kinds of things. But uh, Miles Davis's soundtrack and the, the film noir soundtrack of also of of the modern jazz quartet who at the same year uh had had made a, a soundtrack for a film by um um uh, Roger Roger Vadim uh called No Sun in Venice and and those soundtracks are not at all the sort of uh up tempo big band shouting and screaming those are, are much more subtle and they accompany much more subtle images because they are designed to be atmospheric and and to convey blue feelings and to convey joy and elation which was infrequent in in the film noir genre and to convey a a kind of sense of intimacy between between the characters uh, on this on the screen so uh, even though i mean they're all soundtracks and and they all serve the movies that that they're designed to serve they do that very well but with Miles Davis's uh, work on, on on Elevator to the Scaffold, the feelings that the jazz is used to accompany the, is, are much more subtle. The feelings are um, much much more laid back and 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 calm and and atmospheric. I think is probably the best word. Is there anything else about the film that I forgot to ask you about that you found in your research or in your writing? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, um, I, I like the film. I like the film better now than I did when I was um, a very young man. I thought, I, I thought it was uh, slow moving and, uh, um, o- overdone and so on. But that's because of course it was a genre that was, uh, uh, just coming into into being, and, and we we learned to appreciate it later. But the that genre was uh, perfect for for the kind of of work that Miles Davis was capable, the kind of accompaniment that Miles Davis was was capable of doing. So I mean, there 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 are some wonderful pieces of music that stand up independently. They they work magnificently in the film, but they also are very much listenable. Uh, I mentioned Florence Shirley's song, Champs Elysees, which is a wonderful blues that Miles Davis plays uh, in the film. It accompanies shots of Jean Moreau simply walking, 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 walking in the rain. Uh, and it's it's beautiful that way. There's a lovely piece called Au Bar de Petit Bac, uh, and, and that's a simultaneous improvisation between the tenor saxophone player Barney Weiland and Miles Davis on trumpet, and it and th- this is a piece of music that that stands on its own and and is very gratifying to listen to, but probably the the best single piece of all is is called a dîner dîner au motel the dinner at the motel, and it's a muted trumpet solo that Miles plays with accompaniment only by the bass and drums only by Kenny Clark on drums and Pierre Michelot on bass, and. And it is a magnificent ballad, and it's just a great shame that Miles Davis didn't come back to the United States at the end of his three-week stint and play that in some of his concerts, because it's a glorious, glorious ballad uh, that, that he plays, and improvised at the time, but but it sounds as if it's uh, uh, been assembled with, with great care. Certainly it is assembled with great care and taste, but it was all... Uh, simultaneous, all uh, improvised at the time. Wonderful, wonderful piece of music called Dine O Motel. The four minutes long, too. So there's a uh, wonderful music that survives in its own right, but uh, it also is a magnificent accompaniment to a, a, a moody and interesting piece of film art. As for him as a composer, did he do any other film? Because this is the only one that I can think of. 
he in the in the nineteen eighties he did a blues film that I'm having trouble remembering the name of. In the nineteen eighties he also did a movie called was it called Siesta? Whoa. Um, uh, so there are two film soundtracks from from late in his career, but right now. I'd have to look them up because I've uh, I've I've forgotten the details. They are interesting in their in their own way, but um, um, not shattering, not earth shattering the way the way Elevator to the Scaffold was. So he did have another crack at it very late in his life when he was playing more electronic music, more jazz rock fusion, rather than uh, the kind of cool uh, modal music that he was playing at the time of Elevator to the Scaffold. I was going to ask as someone who's a biographer, and have you heard about or seen anything related to the uh, Don Cheadle biopic and what's your interest in that? I, I've, I've only seen stills of, of the, from the Don Cheadle uh, movie so far. Haven't haven't seen anything else. Uh, I mean, it's remarkable how much Don Cheadle does not look like Miles Davis in, in the, the stills that I've seen. Um, he uh, looks a bit like Mums Mabley. In fact, that's uh, something that he's going to have to worry about when the, the critics get hold of it. But um, what I understand, what I know about it, is that he concentrated on Miles Davis's um, years of illness when he was retired from 1975 to 1981, and he concentrated on that apparently on that particular area, even though it was. Uh, a kind of a nasty time for Miles Davis, drug-addled and uh, reports of, of beatings of, up of girlfriends and, and these kinds of things went on in, in that period. And apparently one of the reasons for concentrating on it was because Don Cheadle didn't want to have to pay for the music that, that would have been necessary in any other part of Miles Davis's career. This was Miles Davis's silent time, so to speak. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'm 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 interested. I will look. I will watch the movie. I will look at it carefully. Um, I don't hold out a whole lot of uh, hope or expectation or anticipation for it. If people want to get into his work, I mean, for me, I always say kind of blue. But um, where are some good places for people to start? Well, kind of blue is 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 in fact a. a a wonderful place to start, and it has appealed to people. Uh, anyone who likes music of of any kind, I think, is is can can be moved by, swayed by, a uh, kind of blue, and that's music played by a sextet um, with great players all around. Bill Evans on piano, Ed Cannonball Adderley, and John Coltrane playing saxophones with Miles Davis. So. A, a, a brilliant group, but I, I would think that uh, other other entry points might be uh, with the Gil Evans orchestrations, which are I like Concerti Grossi, where, where uh, Miles Davis is the only soloist in with a 19-piece orchestra, and the orchestrations by Gil Evans are magnificently geared to show off Miles Davis's uh, greatest assets. And th there are three of those, and uh, they they all come right around the same time as Kind of Blue. One is called Miles Ahead. That was the first of them, and it's as good as any. One is Porgy and Bess with the, the score from George and Ira Gershwin's uh, opera, uh, beautifully orchestrated and beautifully played with Miles Davis as the, the so-called singer, right, the aria. The arias are all played by Miles. And then there's... Um, Sketches of Spain, which came two years after that, and so in 1961, and and it also is, makes a wonderful entry point uh, into the sound and and the sensitivity, the sensibility, really of of Miles Davis. So all of those are also excellent places uh, to leap in. Uh, people, I, there, there's a recording. Bitches Brew was was Miles Davis's second best-selling recording. It came much later with electronic in instruments, with three electric pianos, in fact, in the background. And so it, it, it uh, is fairly noisy and quite rhythmic, but, but on top of the rhythm, you still hear Miles Davis. But there's, uh, I'll tell you, Rob, there's a, 
the recording that immediately preceded Bitches Brew is called In a Silent Way. And it also makes good use of amplified instruments, amplified electric pianos and, and electric guitars and so on. But it is much richer in, in, in its textures than Bitches Brew. And, and so I would heartily recommend for people who who like the sound of electronic instruments who like the excitement of of uh, uh of a kind of um sort of rock drumming um i would recommend in a silent way for for people to to give a listen to miles davis and hear what he's capable of and hear the the beauty of his lines and the articulation of his feelings yeah i'd have to agree with you on that i think Bitches Brew gets the notice it gets because of the title, and then the album art is quite amazing. It really but there, is. <laughs> but there are times it's quite atonal. That, that's right. There, there are long stretches of Bitches Brew where Miles is just holding his trumpet in his hand and listening to the burble of, of the rhythmic group, which is a large, large group, and a, a group with a, a fair an amount of dynamics, but, but it... Uh, I think it's more interesting to see than it is to listen to after the first couple of minutes. Is there any place where people can keep up with your writing or anything related to this book or any other books you have on jazz? Well, I I I, I do have another book in print uh, about a jazz piano player whose name is Richard Twardzik. It's called Bouncing with Bartok. And Twardzik was a magnificent piano player from Boston uh, who unfortunately died at the age of 24 from a drug overdose when he was in Paris playing with Chet Baker's quartet. And he left behind just two hours of magnificent music and about six hours of, of concerts and other kinds of music, but two magnificent hours. And, and you can find out about uh, that book and, and other things that I've written about jazz musicians on, on my website, uh, which is, uh, um, well, you you have it on my on my email uh, address, the, the the website. So there's a um, a side of that the home page that directs you to the jazz writings and and also tells you a little bit about other things that I've written. I've I've written lots about Duke Ellington and many many other um, jazz musicians as as well as Miles Davis. But I think uh, probably uh, Miles Davis is. Uh, the one I get calls about most often. Just before I leave you, what is it about jazz that you think is underappreciated or people don't understand? I think many people think that it is more complex and harder to comprehend, to appreciate, to understand. When when I was a high school boy, that was not the feeling. The 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 feeling was that uh, you know, this this is is music that has a, a kind of a certain complexity, but but the, the complexity is is more than um, compensated for by by the the kind of depth of enjoyment that you get. Nowadays, lots of people seem to be frightened um, by the idea of of that complexity. And I don't. I mean, some people would say, well, that's because the music world has been dumbed down in the last twenty or thirty years. But I'm not so certain that's true. I, th- I think uh, people who at some point get tired of listening to Taylor Swift or uh, certainly to ABBA and uh, all kinds of other people in between those those two, uh, people who who want a little more substance, uh, they, they should turn to jazz. And, and a good place to start is, is with Miles Davis, of course, because he is so accessible emotionally that, that you don't have to worry about uh, what it is he's doing technically with the music. And then, so that's a good, a good place to start. That's what I think to answer your question. I, I think people, uh, are, are ready for, for a richer musical experience than they get in their teenage years from, from the various um, you know, pop groups that they listen to. And I, I think they would be very gratified if they would just give a, give a try to some of the great jazz players, the contemporary ones and the ones in the recent past. Sounds good. Thank you so much for your time. It's great, Rob. Nice, nice to talk to you. Thanks very much. 
Southern and Jack Chambers for joining us. You can learn more about their work and pick up copies of their books on our website, projection-booth.com. We're back talking about Elevator to the Gallows. So, gentlemen, since you are much more studied up on film noir than I am, how does this fit in for you? I feel uh, that it's it's almost out of time. I don't know. I don't, I'm not very sure where it falls, what it influenced, and what you know, I thought breathless uh was being referenced here but then i found out no breathless came later so i i would say that it uh it's about as evocative of that uh that film noir tone that uh that atmosphere that uh existential uh issues playing out in all the in the background of of a crime story um you know it's 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 about as perfect a, a example of the form did, did you get a chance to read the book? You know, I didn't. I think <laughs> I knew it was based on a book. Uh, and I think I was thinking of uh, Build My Gallows High, which ah. is the basis for Out of the Past. Because, uh, yeah, I, I, kept, I kept meaning to read that. But I did look up uh, the book and I couldn't find an English translation. So I don't know if, if there was one that's that's not around anymore or – if I'm just terrible at using the internet, but <laughs> yeah, it was written by Noel Kalef, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, who interestingly enough, he's, he's credited as doing a pre adaptation. So I'm thinking that he, maybe he took the first swag at his own novel and then, um, Mal and, um, uh, Nimier came in, Roger Nimier and kind of, uh, took the next, uh, piece of it, and it's it's strange to look at the credits of this because it's Noel Kalef as the novel and the pre adaptation, and then Nimier for dialogue, and then Louis Mala Nimier for the adaptation. So definitely a different way to break down the script than I'm used to by seeing the the way that they divvied that up. But yeah, I, I uh, it seems like. This was probably written a little bit earlier than it was shot, of course. You know, you don't write them and then stick them right in the typewriter most of the time. But um, it did seem to capture that post-war angst, the the post-World War II angst. And then I didn't necessarily realize how many conflicts France was in post-war. I mean, I always think of the U.S., you know, kind of moving from World War II pretty darn quickly into Korea and then not too long after that being quote unquote advisors over in Vietnam. And it's interesting how the, the history kind of parallels as far as that goes with, you know, as soon as the war seems to be over, then it seems like the Indochina stuff is happening for France and then the stuff in Algiers and all the colonies. So it's one thing that America didn't have "Quote unquote," going for it when it comes to you know we've got some some uh, uh, some properties out there um, you know Guam and and the Philippines and some of these things, but uh, luckily you know we we didn't have a lot of colonial problems, but France was rife with colonial problems after the war. Um, instead, we just made our own problems by sticking our noses in where they didn't necessarily belong in the name of fighting communism. But uh, yeah, it's uh, so you can really get that angst of post-World War II, but then also the post-Indochina war and the stuff that's happening in Algeria and everything all bundled into this. So it's nice that we have that kind of you know the the way that the war served, and I know film noir was a pre World War II phenomenon, but it really feels like there's a a shift post war film noir for me, especially those damaged heroes that I was talking about before, and then also you know there's a lot of like oh what did you do in the war kind of thing. We saw a lot of people coming back, you know, characters coming back from the war who had maybe not been uh, the best people. 
um, when they were away. You know, th- yeah. speaking of Dixon Steel, but I know that there were other characters as well. So it, it really captures that for me as well. And it's nice. It is in that sweet spot of post war. It's got the the kind of calle du cinema type thing going on as far as the I don't want to say aping of American film, so it really playing in that that noir space and then that pre French New Wave that we have. So it's it's really in that nice spot for me as far as how this sits in a historical context. But yeah, I mentioned earlier there's a a remake of the film. Oh, I don't know if I should even try the Japanese here. Shikeri ai no Erebeta. Um, so yeah, the Erebeta is obviously elevator. Uh, it was from 2010. Uh, Akira Ogata was the person that directed that. And uh, it's really, it's strange to see it because even though it is from 2010, it does seem to be kind of timeless with a lot of this stuff it switches out a lot of the post-war angst of course which i think kind of robs the film of a lot of its character uh of course we have to add in some kind of like yakuza type stuff going on in there i wasn't able to follow it a hundred percent because of the lack of subtitles there's some dream sequences that happen when we've got uh the the julianne in the elevator these kind of things but it really follows it along pretty darn closely to the point where they're, you know, taking the drugs and trying to kill themselves. And it's just really, you know, and the final shot is of the, the photograph in the, in the uh, developing tin kind of thing. So it's just like, okay, yeah, this is really very close. Um, it looks beautiful. It was very well shot, but it was shot in color and it doesn't have that lush black and white cinematography that we see in Elevator to the Gallows. So I wouldn't does necessarily it, recommend tracking it down. Does it have uh, flashbacks? Does it ever put the levers together on screen? I, I want to say in those dream sequences, yes, yeah. um, which unfortunate, is unfortunate because I love that our lovers are separated the whole time in this film, except for that final shot. And then it's not even, you know, live motion. It's that time from a a simpler past before they decided to become murderers. And we're just content being adulterers. And I also hear that coincidentally, the score was done by kilometers Davis. Yeah. You know, because (laughs) Japan is on the metric system, I believe. So yeah. 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 Speaking of that photograph, Jean Moreau's last, last lines as she's talking to herself uh she's almost like putting her like trying to put herself into that photograph i love that that uh i'm not going to age anymore you know she says you're gonna get 20 years in prison and she says 20 years you know his life will go on but i'll stay right here i'll be i'm I'm gonna insert my consciousness into this photograph more or less and 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 that's that's where i am forever now yeah she really if she's not mentally shutting down, it, it's definitely something close to that. And yeah, she's really trying to take herself out of the world at that point, which I was just like, oh, that's nice. So um, we did mention at the top, anyone else seen any other Louis Mal films? Atlantic City was the only other one I'd seen, too. When I looked at the list, I couldn't believe it. But yeah, and I love that one. That was great. I have not seen Atlantic City. I believe I may have seen years ago... Au revoir, Los Infants, which um, is the impetus for why Reservoir Dogs is called Reservoir Dogs. Supposedly, someone asked Tarantino if he wanted to go see Au revoir, Los Infants, and he goes, no, I don't want to see Reservoir Dogs. And and I don't know if that's true or not. But then, also, uh, I have seen My Dinner with Andre, and our good friend Lloyd Kaufman worked on Our Dinner with Andre and talked about working on it on one of our episodes. Well, first off, you always have to take Tarantino at his word 100% because he actually has the inability to lie. I'm not sure if anybody knew that, but that is uh, kind of his kryptonite is lying. So everything that comes out of his mouth, 100% true. The other thing that I really want to see, I remember outside the cinema covered Black Moon and the way they describe that film. I don't know why I haven't seen it because that sounds right up my alley. And I really need to check that one out because I just hear it as a complete mind fuck. So I really, um, that should 
move higher now on the uh, top of my list. So in a, a Joyce Bunuel uh, was credited as one of the writers. Is Joyce uh, perhaps related to uh, Louis at all, or did she just kind of take that name? I have no idea. All right. I no. guess we'll find out. All right. That, that might go. be good for something in uh, 2017. Because we're planned out that far in advance, in case yes. you didn't know. Yes. <laughs> so, um, we have anything uh, we want to add about Elevator to the Gallows? Anything missing? I was really glad that you turned me on to this film, because like I said, I hadn't seen it before. Um, coincidentally, uh, it was just on TCM a couple weeks ago, so I did set the DVR for that. So that was the perfect timing to be able to catch that for the first time and be able to record this episode right after. So it was nice to uh, see a really nice-looking print of it, too, that they showed. I would love to see this one in a theater, I think. Yeah, I watched it uh I watched it once, and I've I've caught it a couple of times in pieces since. And I watched, I fell asleep watching it, and 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 uh, you know just closed my eyes and listened to it. Of course, it's in French, but it's got that great soundtrack, and I it was it was interesting. And then I watched it uh, kind of in the background one day uh, as I was I was tending to other things, and I I had it with the sound off. So I've seen it both uh, silently, uh, and I've I've heard it only. The you know only the audio and uh, and they were both very pleasant experiences. It's just a great looking visual story and it's a great sounding evocative uh, moody piece. So yeah, these darn French films. You know, I really like them better when they're dubbed and they have Americanized soundtracks. <laughs> That's right. And it should be in color too. Yeah, why not? Ted the, Turner, where are you? Who the hell wants to watch black and white? Oof telling you all right we're going to take a break and play a preview for next week's show the comfortable camera yes thanks you seen the flat yes and you like it yes it's great what on earth could make you think we'd want to share a flat like this with someone like you <laughs> you must be hugo and you must be juliet can you open your door it's us your flatmates and companions your newborn friends I've never seen a dead body before I saw my grandmother of course but I don't suppose that counts I mean she was alive at the time it's not every day I find a story in my own flat it's not a story Alex it's a corpse can I show you something it's a sick idea Alex it's sick go ahead then telephone the police tell them there's a suitcase full of money and you don't want it (laughs) Let's do it. Let's talk about disposal. Who's going to do it? We all are, David. We're all going to do it. Each of us, you, me, and Juliet. I don't think I can. But Juliet, you're a doctor. You kill people every day. Is this necessary? I can't do it. Do you want to play or not? I know you well enough. Oh, you think so? We don't know how much it cost us yet. Let's spend some money. For you two to have a good time, we don't know the cost of that yet. You're fighting. I'm not fighting. I'm a little terrified, maybe. They went there alive and they came back down dead. Did you notice that? The difference, I mean, alive, dead, dead, alive, that sort of thing. It wasn't difficult to spot. That's right, next week it's in color, and not only that, Scottish accents. It's the final week of this year's Noir November, as um, delivers to your doorstep some Scottish flavor from Danny Boyle, Shallow Grave, so don't miss it. But before we run, I want to thank our special guests, author Nathan Southern and Jack Chambers for joining us, and also our special guest co-host this week, Jedediah Ayers, and sir, what's the latest with you? My uh, book of short stories is is coming out again uh, early in the new year. It's called a fuckload of shorts. Nice. And, uh, and I've got a new story in a in a book called Jewish Noir that just dropped. But uh, I'm I'm a bit in between novels right now. Holy shit! You're not Jewish, are you? I'm not Jewish. I got invited to be part of that. Uh, Whew, man, I was afraid. 
Yeah, I was wondering if that's why you hadn't invited me on the show yet. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we definitely have a no Jews allowed policy. You didn't know that? <laughs> well, I I would have been more outspoken. <laughs> No, trust me, I'm a goy. I'm a goy. <laughs> Do you have a website or someplace where people can keep up with you? Uh, I have a blog. It's uh, The blog is called Hard Boiled Wonderland, but the uh, address is www.spaceythompson.blogspot.com. S-P-A-C-E-Y-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. And that's uh, that's a long story. And I'm on Twitter at Jedediah Ayers. Now, do you do the – you remember like the noir at the bar kind of stuff down there, right? I – yeah, I do that. Uh, and the past – I mean, I've been doing that here in St. Louis since 2009. I think Peter Rozovsky had done his last one in 2008 up in Philly before he just picked it up again. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing it for several years here. And uh, I, that's why I wasn't here able to talk Wednesday. I was in uh, – I was in Dallas doing one there, so it's it's fun seeing them all over the place now. Now, for folks who aren't familiar with Noir at the Bar, can you explain to our audience what that is? Yeah, it's just a it's a live reading event. I've, I'm a I'm a an author and a a reader mostly, you know. And I I would love to go to uh, book events and and meet authors and hear them read. But my God, they're almost always very dull. Uh, so uh, my screenwriting partner Scott Phillips, who uh, I know you've had on the show once or twice, uh, uh, he attended one of those events in in Philadelphia where they did a live reading, and you know the, a lot of great crime writers in Philadelphia. So they came out and, and supported it, and it was a great community thing. He said, "Man, I wish I wish we had something like that here." And then you know several months later, we both said, "Yeah, I wish we had something like that here." And then. <laughs> Excited. Well, I don't think anybody else is going to do it, uh, so we'd better. And uh, it's yeah. So it's just a uh, it's it's evolved a little bit from what Peter uh, was doing, um, where I think he had a single author read and then was interviewed on stage at a at a bar. So there's plenty of booze and it was kind of rowdy. Uh, we kept the booze and the rowdiness and the crime rating, but uh, we threw a few other writers into the mix. These. Uh, a lot of really big lineups now with you know just a whole bunch of authors but I, I i like to think it's it's almost more like going to see a uh you know to a comedy club than a, an, an author event just that entertainment value is is what we're after uh not the you know there, there's there's a lot of stuff that that reads well in your head that uh you know makes for a fairly dull um live event so uh we always can encourage the authors to be very uh, provocative and dirty <laughs> and the audience to be very rowdy and uh, abusive. Very nice. Heckling is encouraged. Uh, it is not discouraged. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, no, I, it, heckling happens. Heckling happens. Yes. Very nice. All right. Well, thanks once again, Jed. Thanks for coming on the show. I'm glad that we were able to get you on here. Yeah, thanks so much. You know, I would have told you, hey, I'm not Jewish, just to just to be clear. All right. Uh, good to come anytime. <laughs> All right, yeah. Yeah, now you're cleared with the board. Yeah, appreciate yes. it. Yeah, we'll, we'll let the uh, the people at the Aryan Brotherhood know now that we're okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody, for listening. We hope you'll consider going over to our website, projection-booth.com, taking the time to leave us some feedback, maybe some, uh, you know, real uh, pro-Semitic messages on there or something, if you actually think that we're being serious. Go on over to iTunes, leave us a review, donate some of your hard-earned cash to our Patreon, or just say hello. It's just a few more ways that you're going to help us take over the world.
If you enjoy this show and want more people to know about it, head on over to iTunes, leave a comment, and rate it five stars. Make sure you like and share us on Facebook, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Just search for Christopher Media. Thank you in advance for supporting Christopher Media by clicking on the PayPal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support ChristopherMedia.net. Most importantly, we would like to take the time to extend an extra special thanks to you. Christopher Media could not exist without your support. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net, and thank you for listening. Christopher Media, let's make some noise.